Okay, so we are at the top of the hour. It's 10 a.m. Mountain Time here. Um, we are assembled here for the first uh, webinar, I guess, for the Missouri River Basin AIS team of the 100th Meridian Initiative. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, so I know, I, yeah, like I just mentioned, this is the first time we've ever done this. I'm gonna have Steven say a couple words and then I'll talk a little bit about housekeeping and whatnot. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to you, Steven. Thank so you. Hi everybody, um, welcome to this virtual meeting of the Missouri River Basin team. Uh, Missouri River Basin team has its roots in the early 2000s. Um, Maybe I can back up a little. The 100th Meridian Initiative, initiative itself um, is written into uh, the National Invasive Species Act amendments um, going way back into the 90s. Um, the objective is was to keep mussels from moving past the 100th Meridian Initiative. Um, we've kept the name and um, there are two active basin groups right now and have been over the last 15, 18 years, the Columbia River Basin Team and the Missouri River Basin Team. The Missouri River Basin Team got um, uh, a boost from the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial as uh, we feared that there would be thousands of boats reenacting um, the event and moving mussels from east to west. Um, so there were a lot of outreach materials done. We did travel and information systems. We visited marinas. Uh, the states did a lot of outreach and um, turned out that not a lot of boats showed up, but it helped form kind of the basis of the uh, Missouri River Basin team. And so we've been meeting uh, ever since. And I, as I look over some of the names, uh, Kim Bogenschutz may be, uh, one of the only folks from the early days. So Kim, welcome to you. Um, so as you guys have probably seen over the years, uh, the Missouri River Basin team has been uh, meeting annually and we do some group projects. Usually it's uh, some type of supply purchase, bait buckets, um, uh, informational cards, things like that. Uh, but now things have kind of been ramped up because of WERDA and um, if the FY 2021 budget passes, and I'll talk about this later, um, there will be funding for uh, the upper Mississippi basin um, as well as the Arkansas basin if word of 2020 passes, and I'll talk about that later. So that match grant program, um, if <laughs> depending on how much match you have, um, will be important. And I think more and more we're looking at um, the you know the connection between the Missouri and the Columbia and other regions in the West uh, as mussels continue their westward movement. So. I think with that and also everything going on with Asian carp, that it's good this group meets and we can discuss more towards the end of the agenda what you think this group should do going forward as there are lots of groups out there. So, um, and we want to thank um, Joanne Grady, uh, Denver Fish and Wildlife Service Office for uh, funding the Missouri River Basin team over all these years. So Leah, I'll turn it back to you. And I look forward to the uh, presentations we're going to hear. Great, thanks, Stephen. So again, just because we've had more people join, um, my name is Leah Elwell with Invasive Species Action Network, and I'm going to help facilitate this day of meeting um, with you all today. So I've I've been to one MRB team meeting. It was a couple of years ago uh, when it was in Bozeman. So, but it's been a while since I've uh, gotten to hang out with the majority of you folks so thanks for um letting me join the team here if you will um so today we're gonna do that we're gonna kick off this with um 
you know, some pretty quick updates from uh, the state partners that encompass the basin. And then we're going to hear a short update from um, Joanne Grady from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, take a little break. And then we're gonna hear from uh, Emily Figueroa with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service to talk um, carp perspectives, et cetera. And many of you are probably used to interacting with her as well. Um, and then we're going to have a, um, some information shared on the Water Resource Development Act. Both uh, Stephen Phillips will come back on again, and then Clayton Ridenour with the Army Corps of Engineers. And then at the, the end of that, that last little bit there, the we have actually it's a considerable amount of time, maybe 45 minutes, half hour or so, um, discuss kind of where you guys want to go next, um, and just sort of the, the future pieces that this group is wanting to tackle or meeting, et, et cetera. Um, so I know you guys can't, but it's a little, you, please bear with me during this process. I want to make sure I am able to unmute you so people can, if there's something that comes up, you want to discuss something or you have a question, I will do my best to keep track of that and make sure that your voice is heard. I'm not, I don't want someone to feel like they haven't been able to voice a comment. Um, or bring up something of, of importance. So we can do a combination. I am totally cool with if you want to pop up in your, your if you have the capability of showing your face in a video to signify like, yes, you would like to make a comment. Um, we can, you know, try that um, for some of the, the, the meeting. You can also try, you know, raising your hand using the, the go or um, posing a question um, in the chat or question boxes of the GoTo webinar. Um, or I guess last case scenario is if you unmute yourself and say, excuse me, I still have a question if we're really going to move on. So we'll, I'll do my best here to accommodate this. But I, again, I just want to stress, like, I don't want this to feel like radio silence for you guys. But I know this is, you know, we're on this, you know, fun digital platform <laughs> so we can see each other. Um, so before we get into those partner updates, what I am going to do so you guys know um, who is on the line with you? Because I do not believe it is visible who you can see. Um, some of you, I am not sure of your affiliations, but I will um, recite your name just so others that know you um, can see who is here. If I do know your affiliation, I will say it. Um, so I apologize if, I, if I'm not familiar with you yet. Um, so we have Tim Cunahan from the USGS. We have Tom Wolf from Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. We have Stephen Krentz. We have Stacy uh, Schmitz with uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, uh, Robert Walters with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Paul Lapisto, uh, Nick Fronauer with Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, Mike Smith with uh, South, Dakota, South Dakota Game Fish and Parks, Liz Laudman with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, Landon Pierce, Christopher Starr um, with Nebraska Game and Parks, Kim Bogenschutz with Iowa Department of Natural Resources, Kelly Zorn, Keegan Efforts, and let's see, Tara Tweet with um, Missouri Department of Conservation, Josh Leonard with Wyoming um, Game and Fish, Joanne Grady with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Jennifer Johnson, um, Jaden Duckworth with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, Jason Crawl, Jason Geckler, and Jason um, Euchner is how I think that name should be said. And then Emily Figueroa um, with, uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Dan James with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, Craig McLean, uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, Clayton Ridnour with um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Chris Steffen with uh, um, Kansas Wildlife Parks and Tourism, and Allison Zach um, with Nebraska um, Invasive Species Program. So welcome everybody. And okay, so for this next portion I mentioned, we, we in consultation with Kim, she recommended we just kind of um, quickly share um, some of the highlights from your perspectives and your states of how programs have gone um, and things that you're looking at on the horizon. So um, I'm going to scroll through. Thank you so much for everybody for sharing 
your um, update with me. And I'm going to show that. And then let's see, our first person we are going to have speaking with us today is Tom Wolf. And Tom, it looks like I have unmuted you. So you can unmute yourself to begin speaking. If you are there, Tom, I see you on there and I have unmuted you, but you looks like you need to unmute yourself before you can speak. Tom. All right, well, this is interesting. Let me see if I can unmute. Okay, I'm gonna unmute everybody. So hopefully no one's having a full conversation. <laughs> Hello? I have just, I've just unmuted everybody. So if you can self mute yourself at this time, then we can proceed with calm speaking. Let's give it a whirl. Tom? This is really fun. <laughs> Let's just try this. This is Kim. Leah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So you when you unmuted the group. I, and I unmuted yeah. myself. Now you're hearing me. So I'm not sure yeah. what's happening with Tom. I don't know. I just changed Bobby. it. Another, Another. Um, category of speaker to see if that would help him. All right. Well, let's try to. I have you unmuted, Tom. I'm not sure what our issue is. So let's see if we can hear from our next date, which is, I believe on our list was, was North Dakota. So Ben. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear, that, if that's Ben, I can hear you. All good to go then, so. All right, um, my name is Van Holen with North Dakota Game and Fish Department. Um, I took over from Jessica Howell here in February. Um, and I'm really excited to share with you our efforts for 2020. Uh, our program is growing and I really like the direction it's going. Um, with that, I'll touch quickly on some highlights from the 2020. As a department, we really want to address ANF our docks and lifts. Um, in North Dakota, we don't have very many dock and lift manufacturers, so a lot of docks and lifts are coming from out of state. We don't currently have a rule regulating docks and lifts, uh, and it's something that I, I think just our citizens are unaware of the ANS risk associated with bringing these docks and lifts in. So we mailed out 3,000 plus ANF stock and lift brochures to uh, property owners around the state that were, you know, lakefront based. Um, we also partnered with wildlife clubs to distribute zebra, zebra mussel education material, uh, especially to areas that had new infestation of zebra mussels. A lot of these areas are rural, so uh, we, we used local wildlife clubs and partnered with uh, lake associations and stuff to bring um, just general um, ANS education material to these areas. Um, in the future here, we plan to increase our education efforts using digital marketing. Our communication section just got done with a digital marketing campaign for duck hunters. We had a great influx of duck hunters this year with the border being closed. Um, they were very pleased with the click through rates and just overall hits um, with our ANS duck hunter um, marketing. Uh, I think this digital marketing is going to be a great tool to reach uh, users that we haven't been reaching before, um, pleasure boaters, 
wake um, just water sports community in general. I think it's going to be a powerful tool. It's kind of scary how some of these digital marketing uh, companies can take cookies and data and specifically target individuals. Uh, I think it's going to be a real powerful tool for our department just to get more people in general and get a bunch of different users too. Um, on the monitoring side, uh, we were very busy um, collecting uh, early detection samples this year. We uh, sampled 143 waters. A lot of these waters were sampled twice a year. Um, that's up from 40 from the previous year. Um, we, at our bigger water bodies, we, we, we collect a lot more water volume than we have in the past this year too. So um, we're still waiting on a few samples, but the good news is, is most of them are, are, they've all come back negative except one here. So um, we did have one new zebra mussel infestation at Lake Lemoore. Um, this was, uh, we, we found zebra mussels, adults spread throughout the lake. And then we subsequently found um, villagers throughout the James River uh, in very, very low quantities. We didn't locate any adults. The good news is it was a slow year for Asian carp. Um, we had dedicated sampling in June and July. And we did not even see a carp. Um, I had one credible, credible report about an Asian carp. Um, so great news for us is, you know, we, we've seen more carp in the past and it's an older year class of I think of a 2010 fish. So hopefully that year class is dying out and we'll be free of Asian carp up here in North Dakota. That would be great. Um, we also sampled 14 of the most popular waterfowl hunting areas. Uh, in the state of North Dakota, these are areas that our biologists are not on all the time, so we don't have eyes on them. Um, and they're very, they get lots of fall attention from duck hunters, both residents and non-resident. Uh, we didn't find any ANS in these water bodies, so that was also great news. Uh, we, we, we did find a, a new, I guess, for our department, new ANS in the state of North Dakota, I should mention too, and that was flowering rush. Um, and that was our first documented occurrence of that in the state. Uh, Prevention-wise, um, we doubled our watercraft inspection hours from the previous year. Uh, we added two, neat, two new teams um, to our North Dakota water inspe our watercraft inspection crew. Um, I was also able to carry watercraft inspectors longer into the fall um, than previously before. Um, we're really optimistic about growing our watercraft inspection program. We inspected 2087 watercraft. This was up about double from last year. Um, and we also work closely with the Corps of Engineers on Lake Skakawea to inspect over 50 pieces of large commercial equipment. And we had to decontaminate a handful of equipment, um, but the Corps of Engineers there on, on Lake Skakawea was great to work with, um, great to get those boats decontaminated uh, and barges, and then just making sure we're safe getting on the water. Um, for the future, we have plans to grow our watercraft inspection and decontamination program. I think like many states, um, we, we just have a lack of applicants right now. So I, I've really, uh, as a department, we've really tried to get a wide range of user groups out there. I got sportsmen's clubs and lake associations probably actively recruiting watercraft inspectors for, for me in this upcoming season. Um, we're also going to implement here more traditional uh, decontamination on our infested water bodies and um, larger water bodies that receive a lot of NR traffic. So I'm really excited in the direction we're going in North Dakota. Um, we're, we're a small agency, but we're bringing a lot of users to the table and we're getting a collective effort here. So I look forward to growing our program here in North Dakota and hearing from the rest of you guys and um, just learning. So appreciate it. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, let's see, we will keep going down the line here. So I believe it is South Dakota next. So Mike, if you want to unmute yourself and hopefully that'll work. And then Ben, if you want to make sure you're muted, that would be good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, great. All right, so um, no, I'm not going back into AIS work. It seems I can never leave it, but uh, I'm giving the <laughs> update today. Um, so to start off, uh, Mike Greiner took over from me in 2017, and he actually left for a job with Idaho Game and Fish right before COVID started. So we had been without a coordinator since about March. 
Um, we're actually doing phone interviews tomorrow, the first round of interviews for our new coordinator, and hopefully we'll have someone in place by the end of December here. Um, so the big story, I guess, for AIS in South Dakota this year was um, with the expansion of zebra mussels into to Lake Francis Case and Lake Sharp, that caused our governor to take notice. And finally, after after seven to ten years of, of harping on the administration, we finally got some support for AIS work in South Dakota. So we had um, a suite of legislative action that happened in early or in mid January into February, and so we now have. Um, AIS laws or statutes on the books. And what that did is allowed us to now have a mandatory WID program um, and also created an escalating fine structure for violators. Um, so essentially what, it, what got put into statute was basically the model law um, was produced by WRP. Most of those sections were included in that statute. Um, but like I said, the biggest thing was probably our WID expansion as a result of that because before it was all voluntary inspections and now we have mandatory roadside stations um, so as far as zebra mussel expansion south dakota so lake francis case is the second reservoir second reservoir from the south on the missouri river system um, fairly large reservoir now infested with zebra mussels pretty much the entire length um, lake sharp is the um, next reservoir up on the system that one is about inf infested about halfway up we haven't found anything um, upstream of about west bend which is about halfway up the reservoir we do have three smaller waters in east river south dakota that are positive or infested now um, and likely one that will come out later this week so that'll be a fourth one um, so muscles are spreading around in south dakota um, so mainly what i wanted to focus on for this update was how we've expanded our wid program um, in south dakota so we have we have finally finally taken the steps where we're we're drinking the WRP Kool-Aid and we have switched to a, a very big um, portion of our AIS program is now WID. Um, so what we do is we have mandatory roadside check stations um, and those kind of rotate throughout the week. Basically, what we're doing is trying to follow the tr the boater traffic. Um, so right in the middle there, where all those those purple um, dots are there that's pier and so lake oahe is that big lake running straight up the middle that's our biggest fisher destination fishery um, we had two wid crews stationed out of this office in fort pier i want to say they did something like 3500 inspections over the course of oh uh, probably about mid-june through august um, and then each of the other offices had uh, one crew with the exception of the rapid city office those red ones they had quite a few um quite a they had uh, roving stations at quite a few of the Bureau of Reclamation reservoirs. Um, so overall, we jumped from about 2,000 inspections a year to just shy of 10,000 inspections this year um, with plans to continue to ramp that up next year. Um, overall, I think we um, did full decons on about 40 boats, but those were from um, uh, boats that were stored in marinas on Lewis and Clark or on Lake Francis Case, so we knew those were infested boats, so they weren't boats that were um, traveling down the road. They were right there at a marina. Um, we just got word that we've got some additional funding for BOR for 2021, and that's for the reservoirs in western South Dakota. So essentially, what we're going to be doing moving forward is treating South Dakota as as two different states almost. Western South Dakota is a lot like the states to the west, to WRP. Um, so that's going to be more of our um, inspections, kind of, we're, we're trying to keep things from moving west in South Dakota. East River, South Dakota, we're more of a containment, or more of a kind of like along the lines of what Minnesota and states to the east do, where we're just trying to keep things where they're at. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, it's gonna be a lot of folks next year that we have to hire, so we'll see what happens. Uh, and then finally, on the last little slide that I had sent to Leah is just the numbers here. So it was a, it was a pretty big jump for us. Um, I think overall program budget, I think we ended up spending just shy of half a million dollars on wood last year. Um, so I'm not sure if that's sustainable in the long run at current funding levels, but that's the plan for the next year. Great, Mike. Um, well, that's exciting news for South Dakota, all that. So wonderful. Thanks for joining in and agreeing to 
to share info too. I know you wear a lot of hats here. So, um, all right, well, staying on track here, I believe we are up next with Wyoming to give their updates. So, John. Hi, Leah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. Um, so, up 2020 in Wyoming was uh, pretty new for me, obviously, uh, taking over for Beth Bear in January of this year. So, been in the position for almost a year now and trying to I think finally getting a grasp uh, on the position and um, understanding the, the role. So, uh, some big shoes to fill there, but I think uh, getting there. Uh, in addition, in this past spring, we were able to um, transit, transfer three of our previous contract uh, positions to three new FTE positions. So we have a little more buy-in and um, support from the state to have some permanency within the program in the state. So now there's four permanent positions in Wyoming. Um, hopefully gonna be getting another one or two in the next few years. So looking to expand our capacity to, to five or six permanent personnel statewide. Um, this year we contracted with Muscle Dogs out of California to come and visit our busiest check station in the southwest corner at Evanston. Um, you can see the picture in the bottom left. Um, that's Barnacle, who came out and spent five days at the check station um, sniffing boats and doing a lot of education and outreach um, with our folks at that check station. Um, this year was a big year for rapid response plans. Um, Wyoming currently doesn't have any suspect or um, listed waters, but we um, are preparing for the day if and when that does come. So we've developed uh, 23 detailed rapid response plans for our highest priority waters. Um, these go into detail as much as what will happen on day one, um, as well as kind of giving a rough out, out idea of a budget so we know and can expect what this might cost. Obviously, these are great in theory, but it's something just to help um, lead us in the moment of chaos when that comes. Um, so those are looking at getting finalized in 2021 with commission approval in July. So that's been a pretty large workload for us. Um, so quick inspection summary for 2020. Um, as probably most are aware with COVID, we saw a ton of boats and an increase in traffic this year. In 2019, we saw 52,000 inspections. This year, we had just over 75,000 inspections. So a 50% increase in one year was very huge for us. Um, about 4,500 of those were high risk with about 700 decontaminations. Um, we intercepted uh, right around 20 boats with uh, muscle, uh, muscle fowl boats. Um, this year for sampling, we sampled roughly 70 waters. Um, we did not detect any new, new AIS, but we did um, detect some expansion with some AIS we currently have in the state with some new populations of curly pondweed. Um, and we're still waiting for results on our plankton toes for our waters, but we have not detected any adult or anything that would be of concern. So moving forward, I guess some new tasks that our program was tasked with this year, um, kind of with the additional positions we got, we obviously were throwing some new tasks. Um, one of those being fish boarding of out of state fish. So the state of Wyoming does a lot of trading with warm water fish hatcheries in other states because we only have cold water hatcheries. So things like um, crappie and catfish, um, bluegill, sunfish, we will trade with Arkansas and Oklahoma and other states. So when we bring those fish back into Wyoming prior to stocking, we um, board those fish. You can kind of see a picture there in the bottom middle. It's kind of like a Plinko board. Um, we run them all over that board, making sure we remove any non-target um, or any potential AIS that might be on board. The top left picture is a picture of a crayfish that we pulled out of a load. Um, I can't remember where it was from. I think it's from Arkansas. Um, there was a couple dozen crayfish on that load. So again, it's very important and crucial to, to do this. So um, something that we as the AIS program have taken on as a lead. Um, another new task that we are working with is the private hatchery inspection and regulation world. Um, we are looking at um, both kind of expanding that program as well as um, getting it more defined in regulation for us moving forward. Um, so looking into the future, we're going to 
extend our inspection season in 2021. Um, this year we closed mid-September. Um, we're looking at keeping it open until mid-October, late October, depending on uh, funding. Uh, we'll be adding some more seasonal employees in to help with that extension. So adding a few more, I think we're gonna be hiring 51 technicians um, this year. And um, another thing that we're look, pursuing is gonna be doing some online training. So looking at moving part of the front half of our training, which is a lot of slideshows and a lot of um, in-class type training online, kind of like Hunter Ed does where you have a, a online portion where folks can do that prior to coming to a field day. Um, so that's something that we're excited about and hopefully will be implemented in 2022. Um, another thing we're looking at doing is getting out of this old age carbon copy receipt idea and um, finally moving forward with technology and moving digitally. Again, with um, the WID database, being able to print receipts, we'll be looking at doing that for, in reality, implementing that in 2022, but piloting it um, the later half of 2021. Um, and then that's about all I had for our future, but I look forward to being more involved with these um, Western wide groups. Just um, this first year has really been trying to get a handle on um, our state's program and my place here. And as I get more comfortable in that role, I'll be able to um, be more involved in, in these groups. So I look forward to that. Great, thanks, Josh. Um, let's see here. Moving through, going going down through the basin here. It looks like um, Robert, you're up for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. All right, mic check. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> okay, thanks, Leah. All right, so Colorado Parks and Wildlife started off our season pretty much status quo back in February. Um, only a couple of weeks into our season, the pandemic really started to take off here in Colorado, and we started to put a lot of restrictions in place. Uh, many things in Colorado went into complete shutdown, but our governor and our agency leadership encouraged Colorado residents to utilize our outdoor recreational opportunities as an effective and safe means of social distancing. So our inspectors were about the only people left out there on the ground. Um, this really forced us to quickly adapt our protocols to make our inspection and decontamination staff safe while they're doing their work. Um, with traveling and gathering restrictions very prevalent here in our state, we were also forced to transition from our typical classroom and hands-on training methods to virtual. Over the course of only three days, we transitioned completely to that virtual training platform. Over the course of the summer, we hosted weekly virtual training sessions, 23 of them in total, and then required our site supervisors to provide hands-on training to their staff. Uh, it worked very well for us. We ended up certifying more than 800 watercraft inspectors and decontaminators in Colorado in 2020, um, which is more than we have ever certified in the past. Um, on July 1st, Elizabeth Brown, who has been the program manager here since the inception of the program in Colorado, vacated her position. Um, I've been doing my best to hold down the fort since that point. Um, the position was finally posted in the last couple weeks and closed at the end of last week. So hopefully that position will be filled by the end of the year. Uh, Colorado voters didn't really care that we had reduced staffing and instead embraced the governor's direction to recreate outdoors, in many cases, seven days a week. As a result, our inspection and decontamination numbers were way higher than anything we have ever seen in the past. Thus far, we're still operating, but we have recorded over 630,000 inspections in Colorado, which is about a 40% increase, and we have decontaminated over 21,000 boats. Just last week, we intercepted our 100th muscle foul boat of the 2020 season, which again is way more than we've ever seen in the past. While the majority of those interceptions, about 70% of them originated from Lake Powell, um, we did also see an increase in the amount of boats being in, transported into Colorado from the east. Uh, we're pretty fortunate here in Colorado that we are no stranger to decontamination, so we are pretty easily able to take on that additional workload. A contributing factor to that is that Colorado has been transitioning away from kind of the industry standard power washers that are utilized for decontamination 
to on-demand or tankless water heater based systems. Uh, we have seen significant improvements over our pressure washers from both a programmatic and on the ground perspective. Um, benefits have included reduced cost of operation and maintenance, increased efficiency due to higher flow rates, certainly improvements in employee satisfaction and safety, and from my perspective, most importantly, consistent temperature output, which increases our confidence in our efficacy of our decontaminations. Looking forward to 2021, um, our ramp-based inspection and decontamination program continues to be very effective, but our inspection and decontamination and also our interception numbers continue to rise each and every year. Um, that certainly does translate to an increased risk, and we know that we are not bulletproof. So with those points in mind, Colorado is considering legislation in 2021 that would allow us to perform inspection and decontamination on our roads, on roadsides at our borders. These border stations would be supplemental to our existing inspection and decontamination network and would really serve the purpose of adding an additional layer of protection um, for our waters. In regards to sampling and monitoring, in 2020, we had restrictions in place that restricted multiple individuals in vehicles or on boats. As a result, we had to transition to single person crews operating almost exclusively from the shoreline. Um, despite that challenge, we were still able to complete the majority of our field sampling. In total, we sampled 175 um, standing and four flowing waters. And through those efforts, we did identify new populations of Eurasian water milfoil, as well as New Zealand mud snails. In response to the growing number of mud snail populations in Colorado, with some input from Leah and the awesome folks at the Invasive Species Action Network, we've deployed seven wader cleaning stations to fly shops and private fishing clubs across the state. They've been extremely well received and we have received a second grant from the Bureau of Land Management to continue and expand that program in 2021. Uh, last but not least, our sampling did not uncover any dry, dry synods, which is awesome and leads me to my final point here, delisting. So for those that aren't aware, the Bureau of Reclamation detected quagga mussel villagers in their routine sampling of Green Mountain Reservoir in August of 2017. As per the regional standards, CPW has considered Green Mountain Reservoir suspect since that initial detection and has been enacting a containment program requiring all boats leaving to be inspected and if destined for another location, decontaminated prior to leaving that facility. Uh, we've been sampling Green Mountain every three weeks from May through November of the last several years. These sampling efforts have all resulted in negative findings, including our final sample that we just collected last week. In addition to CPW's efforts, the Bureau of Reclamation has continued to sample Green Mountain Reservoir and their microscopy work as well as their eDNA sampling has all shown negative results. As a result, at the conclusion of the 2020 season, following the regional standards for delisting a suspect reservoir, CPW intends to delist Green Mountain. This will once again make Colorado a completely negative state for dry sentence. And that's all I got. Great news, Robert. Okay, um, I wanna just double check here. Uh-huh. Go back, and make sure it was. I know one of you didn't wasn't able to send an update, but we have Nebraska next on the list. So, Chris, are you out there? I am. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just great. Go, go ahead. Awesome. Um, for those that don't know me, know, don't know me, my name is Christopher Starr. Uh, for 2020, uh, our <clears throat> our AIS program, we have three roving seasonal watercraft inspectors. Um, you know, much like a lot of the states, we did routine villager sampling, and uh, we're really trying to ramp up our Asian carp sampling. Um, so our staff conducted pilot um, Asian carp sampling in preparation for UNL project and USGS projects with eDNA. Um, probably the biggest thing for 2020 is we hired our first um, program manager, and that's my position. Um, for Nebraska Game and Parks under the Aquatic Invasive Species Program. So, so my position will be the statewide lead. Um, and contact for invasive for aquatic invasive species moving forward. So um, I don't have a lot to say on what we did this year. Uh, we also coordinated with the Iowa DNR on Carter Lake boundary water 
IYDNR detected uh, zebra mussel villagers in that lake, so we're going to keep coordinating um, on that lake moving forward. So, you know, I think we only um, sampled around 900 inspections this year, so not not uh, far fewer than the 600,000 uh, that Colorado did. Um, so, for the upcoming 2021 year, we want we're going to keep doing our watercraft inspections and villager sampling. Um, we are trying to get money to do more watercraft inspectors through reclamation, although we didn't get the first round of funding. So I'm hoping um, that in the future we can get some more funding and expand our, our inspection program. Um, next year, we're also going to evaluate some of our villager sampling methods. So I mentioned Carter Lake. Um, we connected with Iowa DNR. Iowa DNR uses the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers method using a manual diaphragm hand pump um to sample and we use a wisconsin net um we sampled car lake on the exact same time frame and did not detect any villagers while iowa did and for me that's very uh very concerning so next year we're going to do a, a paired study evaluating both those methods to see what works best in our water bodies so um stay tuned for that um, also next year um nebraska has not had a vegetation sampling program and that's very important for detecting we know where our new infestations are primarily for Eurasian water milfoil. So next year, um, we are starting a fairly intensive aquatic vegetation sampling program, very similar to what the Iowa DNR does. So um, that's gonna be a kind of a one-man show for myself. Um, and also we're just gonna try and do a lot more increased target outreach. We've already started to do that. Um, I've sent out a few press releases so far since I started in August. And we're going to keep that up. We're going to try and utilize social media and get some more of these these uh, messages out. Um, and also, we're also going to develop our own in-house villager analysis for rapid response. We are still, uh, as we always done, going to send samples to Montana for our our routine sampling. But um, for for rapid response, we we really need to have the capability to uh, be able to positively identify villagers here um, at Demon Park. So. Um, I kind of alluded this before. We actually don't have a great idea on our distribution of Asian carp throughout Nebraska. Um, so we've contracted with UNL for a couple projects to, to both determine Asian carp distributions primarily through our Missouri River tributaries um, and also doing some eDNA sampling, both on black carp, zebra mussels, and Asian carp as well. Um, we're also going to start bait shop education inspections. Uh, we did a large bait shop. Um, sampling effort a few years ago before I started, but um, none of the uh, bait shops have been inspected since then. So we want to start a rotating basis where we hit a certain percentage of bait shops every year um, to ensure that they're selling what they're supposed to be selling. And then also, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but Nebraska has a non-resident mandatory AIS stamp um, that all non-resident boats must have when launching in Nebraska waters. And that that stamp hunt help funds our program and so far we're only getting about 48 percent compliance on that so as you know as i try and you know build this program we you know we really need some um some some external funding so we're really going to start a lot of education on that starting with our boating guys and some press releases hopefully this year um to really make sure that our, our non-resident boaters have that stamp and that will in turn help our um help fund our program and much more i have a list about 30 different things I want to implement for the program. But um, but yeah, that's what I'm excited to be in this position and um, and, and work with everybody. And, um, you know, I'm just thrilled to be here. So anyway, thanks. Great, Chris. Thank you. Yes, a lot on the horizon there for Nebraska. That's wonderful. Um, let's see here. So next. We are going to move to Iowa. Um, Mike, can you hear me? I can hear you, Kim. Would you Good. like to make this a tiny bit bigger? Would that be helpful for the visual for folks? Sure, it's up to them if they want to do it. When I sent the slide in, I said, oh my gosh, this is really, really busy. So I'm glad it's on the screen. Yeah. Um, I made it a little bit bigger. There you go. How about it, Kim? Okay. All right, thanks. Um, so first of all, yeah, as, as Stephen alluded, I think I'm like the senior member on this team and makes me feel old, but thrilled um, actually to have 
all these new people and, and to hear, and this was always my favorite part of the meeting was to hear what all the states are doing. Um, so those of you who know me know that I talk a lot and I talk fast. So I will try to keep um, my five minutes. I'm also sitting in a car in a parking lot um, and I, you can email me if you want the explanation for that. Um, so I, I threw in some 2019 and 2020 data um, on my update because 2020 was very different for us um, than most years. So um, most years, so like in 2019, we had um, 19 seasonal positions um, and last year we had three. Um, I, I, it's encouraging to hear most of you went on with your inspection programs um, in the COVID world. Um, we did not, we were not allowed um, to hire ours. Lots of different issues with that, including you know, staff were not in offices to help supervise um these um so and we have two full-time staff me and jason Euchner, who i know um is on somewhere as well so um our, our employment numbers were, were way down last year and so our inspection numbers so it's great to compare like colorado to north dakota to us because you know we're all over the board in numbers so um 2019 we had just over 8,000, and and this year we had none um which is unfortunate because we also saw the increase um, in usage at our at our lakes and parks and things like that. We also have, um, we still call them our watercraft inspectors, or, um, but they do trout angler interviews um, on trout streams. And so we just had 88 of those in, in 2019. We were really gonna try to get them to ramp up in 2020, but again, we, we did not hire those. Um, Jason is is key to our aquatic plant um, management program. Um, we 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 treated over 20 lakes both in 2019 and 2020. Many of them are the same. Um, it's Eurasian water milfoil, it's curly leaf pondweed, we, some flowering rush, um, and some new plants I'm going to talk about later. Um, so the survey crew that we do have, um, we have full time two person crew, th two or three person crew based out of Boone. Um, and then in 2019, we actually put one up in Clear Lake. So we had two survey crews going on around the state doing vegetation surveys. And so we, in 2019, we were able to do 111. And, and this year with just our one out of, out of Boone, they, they did 71, they, they worked hard. Um, and when we have our watercraft inspectors, we also do access point surveys. So those are where, you know, the boat accesses, fishing jetties, things like that. And they're just, it's our early detection program. So they're looking for plants, they're looking for zebra mussels. Um, and, and it has been early detection. We've detected Eurasian water milfoil um, a couple, in a couple new lakes because of that, that program. So um, had 87 of them done in 2019. And again, 2020, we, we didn't have any, we've, we've really cut back on, on sampling our adult zebra mussels. Um, so we did four surveys in, in 2019 and eight this year. We're really just the ones that were our first one, like Clear Lake and things like that. We're just continuing to monitor to just see what's happening, see what's happening in these lakes or ones where, you know, we find two and then the next year we find four and they just don't do anything, but then all of a sudden explode. So, um, we do do some surveys for those as well. Take a lot of, um, samples usually um for zebra mussel villagers and and again jason we have our own in-house um villager lab quote unquote microscope in the back room of, of our office um and he processes all those samples um sometimes we have seasonal staff that are able to do that as well um so you know last year we had 72 of our of our own this year we only had 18 and, and we have detected some Zebra mussels, because of that, um, we have some settlement samplers out there. Um, the past two years haven't been great for our Asian carp sampling, just because we 2019 was high water like all year. 2020 started out high water and then no water. Um, but um, we're also doing a study that, that Jason leads and Chris Starr has helped with this because he was our seasonal staff um, many years ago who, who started this project. But we're comparing the condition of Big mouth buffalo are native filter feeders um, in areas with and without big head and silver carp to see if the, there's um, differences in, the, in their body conditioning. So that's our sampling and, and our inspections. 
moving on a little bit to outreach. Um, those of you who, who've heard me talk before know that we've been using geofencing um, for several years to um, target our boaters and anglers at high use boat ramps. And so um, I, I, like I think it was Ben mentioned, it's, it's pretty creepy what, what those um, marketing folks can do with bits and, you know, they know, oh, this is, you know, based on your sites and your locations and things like that. So um, we've done, you know, in, in 2019, we did you know, 650 plus thousand last year. We, you know, we're, we're getting up to close to a million. So when, when somebody pulls into one of our targeted um, boat ramps and they have their location on, they get flashed with an ad saying clean, drain, dry, click here to learn more or, or things like that, specific ads. Um, in 2019, we did some television ads and then also um, targeted video ads. So again, those ads that pop up on your screen that are usually annoying, right? But we can target people again. And we do have a have a really high what they call click through rate. So um, compared to the you know industry average, those who get our invasive species ads are clicking through at a much much higher rate. And then this year we switched to what are called OTT commercials, over the top. So that's when if you're watching Netflix or you know Amazon Prime or things like that, sometimes there are commercials and you can't stop them and so again we were targeting those households that are fishers or boaters or anglers and so we had um 78,000 or almost 78,000 of those commercials um over a two-year period this summer i really was trying to increase that type of outreach because i didn't have watercraft inspectors on there did not do billboards um this year but but did last year they're they're big and spendy and i just don't have data on how effective they are other than Again, it's just people see things multiple times. So our new reports from, from last year and this year. So last year was bad. We had water lettuce um, and water hyacinth. And the the really, so water lettuce in, a, in an urban pond in Ankeny, not super surprising, disappointing. And so we were just, you know, the crew was hand harvesting that out. But we also found water lettuce and water hyacinth in one of our state uh, wetlands, so it's a wildlife management area off of a gravel road. So we know someone literally had to have just gone and dumped them there. And the aquarium owners and water garden is, is an area that I'm really trying to target as well, because this year in 2020 in Boone, um, so our office is just, you know, on the outskirts of Boone, we found yellow floating heart. So a new, another new plant for us. Um, Jason worked really hard with aquatic control, um, used Procellicor. If you're interested, he can tell you more about it. It wiped it out in days. It was amazing. Um, we'll see if it comes back next year. Um, but the Missouri Riverside then for zebra mussels, we did confirm them in like Manawa this year. So Manawa is just it, it, in Council Bluffs, just on the, on the edges of the Missouri River. And then, yeah, Chris mentioned Carter Lake. This is the second time in about um, three years that we found villagers. We have not found adults in our adult surveys out there, um, but we'll still continue to monitor those. Um, looking forward to, to 2021, we hope to be back full staff, um, but, but we'll see. It's, it's, it's been, a, been a crazy year. and just have to throw in there many of you have no idea what i'm talking about but we used to go bowling when we had this meeting and we even had bowling shirts and and everything and one year we found we were in kansas city we were doing a tour on the missouri river and we found we literally found a bowling ball on our tour so i'm not sure who has the bowling ball anymore but we have one named mike and there was another one so we've got bowling balls and we have trophies so if anybody knows where they are let Stephen or I or Leah know because they're just legacy for us. Thanks, everybody. Excellent, Kim. Great. I know. I hope we can all take our hand at, at bowling here in the future. That would be <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> so um, let's see. I believe. Um, oh, we're Chris. You're next. 
trying to keep track here. Okay. Chris, you can unmute yourself if you want to go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll just go through what I have here and I'll, you know, if people have questions, hit me up, you know, um, at the end or in an email. Um, the big news for Kansas, um, we've been really um, working on our budget situation. We've um, been stagnant for quite a while um, and we have lots of big ideas and big plans, but the, the hurdle for us was always funds to do those things. Um, so we've traditionally until this year been funded um, through our, our wildlife fee fund as, as far as state funding. Um, so those are dollars that come from hunting and fishing license sales. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've gotten some support from federal grants here and there, um, state, state plan grant every year, which actually increased. Uh, but I spent a lot of time in the last two years um, working with our regional advisory committees to our, our Kansas Water Authority. Um, and we were successful this year in, in the first time ever in securing um, state general fund money through them. Um, for aquatic nuisance species work in the state. Um, so that opens up some new doors for us. It, it wasn't a huge amount of money this year, um, but given the COVID situation, um, we were the only new program funded and they um, cut funds out of several other um, projects in that funding. So we're really happy to have gotten our foot in that door and I, I see big things coming from that in the future when um, the state financial situation improves. Um, we also secured a, a BOR grant for, for WID work in Northwest Kansas. Um, our, our plans and hopes in there are kind of similar to, to what Mike mentioned for South Dakota. Um, you know, the, the far Western part of our state is where we don't have mussels and we um, hope to keep it that way and, and work on um, prevention type efforts there. Um, and as we find funding, move to containment efforts in the Eastern part of the state. Um, some other funding we received, um, Kansas is split kind of in half, north and south, as far as the Missouri Basin and the Arkansas River Basin. Um, that puts us in a couple different um, groups that were working on, on Asian carp projects as far as funding through Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we were fortunate enough and we had three um, grants come through for that. Um, two are to work on the, the Kansas River, which falls in, in the, uh, the overall Missouri River Basin. So um, we're pretty excited about that. We're going to be doing some carp removal work and then also exploring the, the opportunity to put a, an acoustic deterrent um, at an existing um, dam location. Um, it's a location where under extremely high flows, carp can get over the dam and so um, we're hoping to, to get something placed there to keep the carp from spreading upstream um, and so the, the overall situation uh, you know we're going to have about three times as much uh, program budget next year as we've had in the past um, but it does put us in the situation where we've basically matched out all of our state dollars with federal funds um, which is great um, but it does lead to um, some some other areas to explore. Um, we were pushing for uh, an ANS or AIS voter fee or stamp like other Western states have. Um, those plans have been put on hold um, due to COVID. Um, again, it's not the right time in the state to ask for funding. So um, we will probably we will make an attempt at that again next year, and probably you know we're going to keep after that. It's you know become kind of a, a common funding source at least for western states and and one that um, we would like to tap into um for example the 105 lakes for villagers around the state um, we don't have results for all of those um, but we did in, in the course of reports from the public confirm two new zebra mussel waters in the state for 2020 um, both of those were private gated communities um, so um, you know, not a huge potential spread to, to public waters, but it's kind of sad to see the 
these were types of water bodies where if they'd implemented some sort of um, inspection protocol before people opened those gates, they could have kept them out. Um, we also have two new lakes with white perch. Um, interestingly, uh, one lake falls into both of those categories. So we we uh, got a report of white perch and while we were there, um, documented zebra mussels as well. Um, and we're, we're kind of suspect of, of how that occurred um, because the gentleman that, that gave us access and tour of the water body um, mentioned uh, how good a job white perch do eating zebra mussels. So um, <laughs> that may not have been accidental, um, but unfortunately now they have two ANS in that one water body. Um, our Asian carp distribution remains the same as far as we know. Um, and hopefully uh, moving forward, we can start suppressing some of those populations. Um, the other big news on the Asian carp front, we, we funded a two year master's project with um, University of Nebraska Lincoln, um, looking at uh, demographics of movement of Asian carp in that, that lower section of the Kansas River, the, the piece that um, is attached directly to the Missouri River. Um, we got a lot of really good information on that project. It's really going to help um, set the background for um, future Asian carp efforts in that system. Um, turns out a lot of those fish um, are residents of that river, at least according to the, the otolith microchemistry information. So um, we feel really good about the idea that um, suppression efforts there will have an impact on the population um, just due to the, the circumstances and the, the uh, the way that those fish tend to, to hang out in that river, at least for now. Um, but overall, um, COVID was kind of a bummer this year. We had plans for a bunch of, of WID activities. Um, those all got put on hold indefinitely by the governor. Um, she just didn't want uh, employees interacting with people as much as possible. So um, next year will be our, our big jump into WID. Um, and it'll be exciting. Um, we've got all of our gear and equipment ready to go. We're set up in the WID regional database. Um, so um, we'll see how that goes. It, they will be voluntary inspections this year. Um, we had also had plans to, to move to mandatory, but again, due to COVID, um, now was not the time to, to push forward on that discussion. So um, that will be something we, we look into doing for 2021. But overall, um, just kind of a weird year. Uh, like everyone else, we had a, a lot of extra fishermen out. We saw a 42% increase in fishing license sales this year in the state. So um, lots and lots of people out and recreating. And that's all I've got for today. Excellent, well, great. Thank you for sharing. That's Okay, so next we go to Minnesota to Nick, and I believe, I don't have a slide for you, Nick, so if you wanna just go ahead and unmute yourself and share for the next few minutes, that'd be great. Thank you, and I apologize for not getting a slide put together for this. Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so echoing what other states um, have said, uh, the COVID crisis um, impacted operations with the Minnesota DNR, the precautions um, put in place by the governor's office, um, limiting the activities we could do and then what activities we could do, the number of people and how the interactions would occur. Um, but our robust water inspection craft inspection program uh, continued to move forward this year. Um, I don't have the numbers with me right now. Um, we have uh, Adam Dole, as many of you know, runs that program, but they will be published in our annual invasive species unit report that usually comes out in January. And I'll make a note to myself to, to try to send that out to the group. Um, my main focus is uh, invasive carp and uh, an update on that. In Minnesota, just the corner of our state is in the Missouri River watershed. And when um, carp were discovered in the Okoboji system in Iowa, our fisheries took it upon themselves to examine um, the different areas 
uh, for potential expansion and instituted about 10 different projects that looked at putting in um, deterrence to prevent the carp from jumping watershed borders into the Mississippi River Basin, um, but also put in uh, a couple of deterrents to protect uh, valuable aquatic resources. And one of those was an electric barrier put at the outlet of a small lake, Illinois, but it was mainly put in to protect um, a round, uh, round lake fishery that's quite popular in Southwest Minnesota. And this, uh, this past summer, one of our fish biologists was out checking um, electric barrier parameters on that and took a look and there's a little plunge pool right below it and noticed what he thought looked like uh, quite a few invasive carp for, for relatively a small area, probably the quarter of a size of a football field. Um, we sent our invasive carp crew down there and sure enough, they pulled out 18 invasive carp um, 12 big head carp, five silver carp, and one grass carp. Um, so the good news is, is it appears that electric barrier um, was doing its job at protecting the resources above it. Um, the sad news is, is we discovered carp and the outlet is, I call it a, I call it a stream slash ditch. Um, it appears that carp could only get up there during high water, which is of no surprise given the high water years. Um, we had previous to it kind of drying up this past summer. Um, one other thing of note, not occurring in the Missouri watershed, but which may have been interest to um, invasive carp biologists out there, managers, is we had a large capture of invasive carp in the Mississippi River uh, Pool 8, which is just uh, above the Minnesota-Iowa border. Um, in the past, we've only had isolated captures, not many, but we caught um, 50 carp uh, in a commercial haul this year, which um, was a bit alarming. Um, we did get out to do a little bit of a response effort before um, the state order came down in March. These were captured in early March, but we are doing a response exercise next spring in Pool 8. Um, called the Modified Unified Method, which um, is being developed by USGS and has been deployed um, in areas where there are high concentrations of carp uh, in Illinois and Kentucky and in Missouri. Um, but Dwayne Chapman with USGS has always been interested in deploying it upriver in a more complex um, braided channel system and where there aren't many carp. Um, so we are moving forward with that in March of 2021. In fact, the logistics team is meeting right now to finalize locations of where they will put the netting efforts out there. Um, we are looking to see how well we can deploy this and how effective it is in an area where there are suspected to be not many carp or not, at least the densities that we're seeing down rivers and I will keep you updated on that um, as it may be interest to states um, deploying it as a response in the future. Uh, that's all I have for Minnesota uh, and I'm willing to take questions if anybody has a quick question on things. Thank you Nick. I don't see any questions at this time, um, and depending on how, when we wrap up here with the last two updates, um, we may have time for a question or two. So um, I guess moving on then to Missouri to Kara. Let's see here. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Welcome. All Go right. ahead. <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, my name's Kara Tweet. I am like some of the others I'm hearing filling in, kind of. Um, Kenda Flores um, held the position of kind of our aquatic invasive lead. Um, she retired in March and besides COVID, we're also going through reorganization. So it's kind of been a double whammy this year. Um, we're hoping to refill her position with a, an invasive species coordinator for the state here in the next, next few months. So in the meantime, I'm filling in on the aquatic side. So I just got a few highlights on Asian carp, zebra mussels, and hydrilla that are in the Missouri River Basin. Um, for Asian carp, we've got um, two studies 
getting ready to start. We just did pilot work for an Asian carp population demographic study. Um, that started in August. Um, they looked at four tributar tributaries, Nottaway, Platte, Lamine, and Grand to the Missouri River and some associated Missouri River bends. So they sampled them for the initial fish community and piloting some of the carp capture techniques, trying to get the bugs worked out. That study will be starting in the summer and fall of 2021, with future years necessary to, to the, till the study is fully completed. The other study is on um, Asian carp management and removal. It is also planning to start in 2021, and the locations will be based on what the demographic study shows. And it is planned to go for four years, and both of these are funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service grant. For carp and other waters, we did get the passage of a fish utilization permit. So it allows individuals under contract with the department and their authorized assistance to take, possess, and transport invasive fish in accordance with terms of the contract um, during a department-sponsored invasive species fish removal project. We kind of had issues on what do we do with all the fish that we remove from a lake that are invasive. So now we have a permit set up where those fish can be um, donated or, or sold to a commercial establishment. So when they're accompanied by a valid invoice or a bill of sale showing how they were um, possessed. Not much new on the zebra mussel front. We continue to track as it shows in the slide at that website, the the sites that have zebra mussels, Lake of the Ozarks, Bull Shoals Lakes are some of our bigger areas that have them. But we're also been working on, um, co did some co-authoring on some papers on the new form of curricula that was found in Illinois and a diet of black carp. Right now, the new form of curricula has not been found in Missouri at this time, but we did co-author on those studies um, in the last, um, couple of years we've been working on that. And then on hydrilla, this is kind of on the very edges of the Missouri River Basin. Uh, the Osage and Blackwater subbasins do have sites that have hydrilla and we have been making progress on removing the plant. It's a long process due to the tubers that get embedded in the sediment. It takes time. Um, right now, we have 30 sites in the Osage Basin that had hydrilla, and 14 of them have already been moved to the monitoring only phase. That means we've completed the treatment process. We're getting the tubers and biomass down to non-detectable levels, but they're in monitoring only phase where we're going out there three times a year, searching with cam underwater cameras and raking to ensure that we're not getting any new, um, new sprouts popping up to start new stands. Um, and again, those are in the upper portions of the Osage and Blackwater basins where we have the hydrilla sites. But 30 in the Osage, and we, you know, getting close to 50% of them, getting them knocked down. And we started on some of these probably in 2013, um, had some high water years that made it a little difficult, but we are getting, getting those tracked down. The Blackwater had five sites, and we're completing four years of treatment on those, but we're also seeing progress definitely seeing progress in tuber reduction in the sediment. So that's some good news where we're tackled something pretty tough and making headway on. So I know that's just kind of a quick rundown for Missouri, but I'm hopingly, hoping um, once COVID gets over with here in a few months that we can start getting more active on some of other um, invasive species inspection and detection efforts. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Kara. Um, we're going to try one more time to see if we can get Kong Wolf from Montana to get the Montana update um, verbalized. So, Tom, if you want to try to unmute yourself, and then Tom has threatened that maybe if he can't unmute himself, that maybe um, Craig McLean, who is also with FWP, can give the short update. So Tom, can you unmute yourself? I 
guess not. This is baffling. Um, Craig, are you able to unmute yourself? I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Craig. Guess what? You're giving the Montana update. Yep, I got about a five minute warning for this. So okay. we're good. Hey, you know this inside and out. Go for it. You got it. <laughs> yep. So I'm Craig McLean. I'm the AIS monitoring coordinator. So I am part of the monitoring side of our program in Montana. So I can speak very well to the monitoring that we do, um, but I can only speak so much about uh, the watercraft inspections from what I pick up from coworkers and what's going on. Uh, but this season, uh, we started um, during the, the, the COVID problems when they were getting bad here and uh, they impacted us um, and our processes a little bit to get going. Um, it cr changed the way we do things a little bit with um, some of our materials we hand out and that aspect, but we were still able to perform our inspections uh, throughout the, the state as our staff and program were considered essential within the, our state government. So um, that made it uh, possible for us to go for the whole season. Um, we, across all of our inspections, we had over 170,000 inspections, um, over 30 different inspection stations. Um, about half of those, 50, a little over 50% of those are ran through contracted stations uh, that we provide oversight, uh, which is kind of new, newer for us in the last few years to really uh, go that way. Uh, we found uh, 35 filed muscles across those states or across those stations. I believe it was uh, five stations, five or six stations that found those 35 muscles. Uh, so though all those stations um, have I believe are all closed or close to closing on the last couple of weeks um, in the some of those more eastern stations stayed op open a little bit longer. As far as sampling, uh, we, we've we sampled uh, quite a bit across the state. Uh, almost every major water body we sampled. Uh, we had um, over 2,500 samples collected uh, for plankton, for villagers, for mussels um, across the state. Uh, luckily, as of right now, we have no had no detections. We're still processing some of those samples um, in our lab, uh, but in the next couple of months, we should wrap up with those, and hopefully that will stay the case. Um, we have found some new detections of some other AIS. We found new populations of faucet snails, uh, curly pondweed, and New Zealand mud snails. Uh, the biggest one being uh, one of our state hatcheries. Uh, during our annual inspections, we found New Zealand mud snails in that hatchery, which uh, required it to be uh, shut down, and we decontaminated it, and uh, it's just in the process of uh, opening back up and getting running again and so it was a lot of work by all of our staff uh, both from the inspection side and the monitoring staff we all worked together with the hatchery staff and and uh, hammered that hatchery out so hopefully that will be able to go back into production this next year um, for all of our a, a large part of it is trout uh, production in the state um, and then the other part is uh, our outreach and education campaign. Liz Lodman's been uh, working, feels like around the clock, uh, to do a lot of this education and outreach. Uh, she works with a lot of partners across the state and is really working to to get out and get our message out, even in the times of uh, being unable to to meet with very many people face to face. She's still working uh, to get it out, and I think it's um, it's a uh, been very notable how how much she's been able to to get that out to the public uh, across Montana and, and also outside of Montana. Um, and I guess that's probably where I'll stop. I hope I hit everything that Tom wanted to hit. I think that'll work, Craig. Thank you for stepping in. Um, yep. I don't know. Tom and I are trying to troubleshoot in the background here, but you know these things happen. So. <laughs> um, Okay, well, I think that wraps up our 
update update. And um, pretty good job, everybody. That was a lot of information in about an hour's time and a little um, techie blip there. So that was good. Um, I guess to just kind of keep us in line, um, we'll just swing right into Joanne Grady from the Fish and Wildlife Service to give uh, a regional program update to us. And then we'll we'll take a short break. So Joanne, are you out there? I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. So I also did not um, produce slides for this, but I have this long list of bullets that I'm going to run through pretty quick. No uh, problem. Go ahead. All right. So first is a, a few Department of Interior uh, bullets. So. Many of you will have seen um, a couple days ago the announcement that the Western Rapid Response MOU was signed and made available. So that's Forest Service and the Corps of Engineers and um, some DOI bureaus, including mine. Um, that document was a good, I don't know, almost 18 months in production. So very excited to have that out um, and potentially benefiting us all if we have rapid response events in the future. The last Safeguarding the West report was also recently um, submitted. And so while all of our Department of Interior bureaus will obviously be continuing our support uh, to preventing quagga zebra mussels, that was the last um, report of that official Safeguarding the West um, effort. The Department of Interior strategic plan should be out in December. So extending thanks um, from Hillary and Smith and DOI to any of you that participated in that series of listening sessions this um, some late summer, early fall, and um, provided comments on that. And then um, the other DOI committee of the last um, couple of years has been our funding leads committee. So that's each of us interior bureaus that provide quagga zebra mussel support. Um, where we're sharing information about our available funds and proposals and trying to pick up proposals um, between bureaus if, if needed. Um, within that committee, Barack Shemai um, led an, uh, the development of an intra-agency agreement, which is basically saying that uh, our at three of our bureaus are committing to funding the Western Boat Database and the WID training that D does through Pacific States, um, that instead of trying to, instead of having those things that are foundational pillars of the Western um, quagga zebra mussel efforts having to compete, um, we're recognizing those are foundational pillars and committing to funding them. All right, so that was all of DOI. Looking at grants, I wanna thank each and every one of you that had to wrestle with us um, this summer and fall with Grant Solutions, our new platform for distributing grants. Um, very excited that all of our grants made it out the door before the end of the fiscal year, a process that in the past would have taken about two weeks of, of my desk time became two months of desk time. And I know that, that you experienced some of that on your side of the table as well. So I wanted to thank everyone for um, their patience and perseverance as we all learned uh, the new system. I do think once all the bugs are out and, and we've all got it figured out that the idea that you'll have a one-stop shop for all of your grants and everything is very transparent and in the system um, will be a benefit. Uh, we are reaching reporting deadlines for your existing grants. So please know that you have to submit your reports within the Grant Solutions platform. Um, historically, you've always sent your reports directly to me versus email, um, but now they go into Grant Solutions. And then the system will send me a note to approve the reports. Um, anybody who had existing grants, when they transferred from the old platform to Grant Solutions, you were assigned some new reporting dates. So, um, and there were some notes from the system for you for that. If those new reporting dates are causing you a problem and you need extensions for those grants, 
then we just need to ask for a modification within the system to add time to your grants. Um, as Chris mentioned, state plans this year doubled. So we're very excited about that. And you know, I know everybody facing all these extra boats, we're pretty glad to get the money. Um, Colorado uh, has their state plan going in front of the ANS task force at the December meeting. So I'm hoping I get to help um, get money to Colorado in the spring as well. Jury is out at this point. I mean, maybe one of you has a better crystal ball than me, but jury is out on what state plan funding will look like for this coming year. Will we get to keep this doubled amount? Uh, who knows? We're in that CR now through December 11th. We'll just have to see what the powers that be do for us with budgets. Um, help distribute the Asian CARB grants to South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas. Um, so thanks again. I know for some of you who weren't the state plan folks, this was your first uh, venture into this grants. Um, so that was a learning curve for all of us as well. 100th Meridian Initiative funding. We did not do a 2021 or a 2020 announcement to compete for funds because of the grant solution situation. We did add additional funds to um, the Don't Let It Lose project, the pet store project that um, Leah has at ISAN, and then our, our every year funding, obviously, to Stephen at Pacific States for this committee and the Columbia River Basin team and the Western AIS webpage and all of those amazing things that they do at Stephen's shop to, as one of our foundational pillars. We do have some existing ongoing grants funded in the previous year or two years, um, all of which were impacted to some extent by COVID as well. Uh, we have a, fun, a project with National Sea Grant Law Center, Stephanie Showalter Ott, who um, is working with Lisa De Deborah Kerr at Creative Resource Solutions. So they, as you know, as those of you who know about building consensus in the past, Stephanie Shop had done the model law and regs and the MOU. And this is a project where they were looking at lo local jurisdictional authorities and they worked with five communities and are, are then going to be producing an online toolbox for uh, local jurisdictions to potentially use for uh, anyway, local regs or laws and how that layers and stacks with um, state and federal law. Uh, they are giving their first presentation on that project in two weeks at the Columbia River Basin meeting. We still have a grant running at um, American Boat and Yacht Council for marketing the technical information report. Again, our long-term hope and goal was that we could see boat manufacturers make some modifications to boat designs to make them either drain better or decon uh, easier. Um, anyway, their marketing efforts were impacted by COVID some this year. Their big boat expo, boat manufacturing expo didn't happen in person. Um, so waiting to hear some more on that. And then uh, the last ongoing that's also been impacted by COVID is we have a project with Nanette Nelson, an economist at the Flathead um, Biological Station in Montana. And she's working with Chris in um, Kansas and then working with the folks in South Dakota. Um, Nanette had developed an economic estimate for Montana on um, economic impacts of quagga and zebra mussels. And in this project, she wanted to go to those areas on, essentially in the Missouri River that are more recently impacted by zebra mussels and get some um, basically ground truth, some economic models for locations um, that have recently been impacted by mussels. Um, and then a um, congratulations to the folks that mentioned they got BOR funding. I um, and one on Jolene Trujillo's scoring committee for BOR um, proposals. And they had um, the ask for that pot was five times the available funding. So um, a lot of, um, so very happy for uh, all of you that won some BOR money this year. Internally, um, still supporting our dive team. The dive team dove at Tiber recently and again, didn't find muscles, which we're very happy about. Um, they've been diving at Fort Peck 
and installed and then checked settlement samplers. So they were doing that um, in cooperation with the state of Montana and the Corps of Engineers. Um, our dive team has recently purchased a tethered um, ROV. So um, hoping to get some better underwater film and pictures and particularly if there are conditions that uh, would make it safer for the dive team to stay on shore or on the boat. Um, we're hoping to get that um, ROV out to Valley City um, Hatchery in the spring, which I, Ben has been dealing with there in North Dakota, um, as they have um, zebra mussels in the source water there. So we're hoping in the spring to get a view of um, impacts to their um, intake pipe there. The dive team will also be participating this coming April in the rapid response exercise at Fort Peck um, that Tom and um, uh, Steve and Leah and Clayton with the Corps, um, anyway, that, that rapid response event is in development um, and the dive team will be helping out with that as well. Um, we are now venturing into Asian carp uh, as Congress provided funding to the Missouri River Basin this year. So in addition to the funding that went to the states and all of the coordination done by Emily Farago, we have some internal Fish and Wildlife Service funding going to Asian carp. So um, Dan James and Jennifer Johnson from their station are, um, have been purchasing equipment and getting gear ready to do some hydroacoustics and telemetry work. Um, Steve Krentz is on the call, and so Tate at his shop has been doing mapping work, and Steve ha is gonna be coordinating our field efforts for eDNA sampling, and then we're gearing up the Bozeman Fish Health Center in Montana to serve as an eDNA lab for Asian carp work. And what else? Um, AIS hatchery inspections continued this year, but due to COVID, each hatchery collected their own samples. Much thanks to Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, not only for processing the samples, but for the really quick turnaround this year. It was fantastic. Um, carp photography project. We have some funds into this really amazing photographer uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service who is um, Click is doing photos in a white box in the lab of juvenile carp, which will be available to all of us for outreach and education for Asian carp. And then HACCP, uh, was, HACCP classes were obviously put on hold due to COVID. Um, I was able to teach class last fall for Chris um, in the state of Kansas, and we had a whole plan to teach 22 classes over two years, um, primarily in the Western US. Um, that has been on hold. Uh, we've just started some discussion about potentials for teaching HACCP online, um, but so far that doesn't exist. And that's all of my bullets. Great, Joanne. You had lots to share. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Okay, well, geez, like we're right, well, almost right on time with our agenda. So I tried I just, to catch us up. <laughs> I know. Well, I want to take a break, let everybody get up and stretch their legs and get some more coffee or go to the bathroom, whatever, grab a sandwich, and then we'll come back here and start back up with Emily's update. Um, so we'll shoot for 1140 if you can come back here, but you know, give ourselves a, a couple of minutes here. Um, so it's 1133 Mountain. So, you know, Let's at least aim to be back online at uh, 11:45. So, and I'll try to troubleshoot some tech stuff too here. So, thanks and everybody. Take a break. And yeah. I, I know I told Julia I actually have to get off the call now, and uh, so I apologize all. I know I should be with you for some of those important discussions later, but um, you'll have them without me, and let me know how it goes. We thanks. will. We'll keep you posted. Thanks, Joanne. Okay, so Tom, I am still here. Um, if you want to try to um, unmute yourself somehow and verbalize to me while we're still here, I oddly enough, I really cannot see you in this list of attendees, which is so baffling to me. 
I really have no <laughs> solution on this. There's Steven. Um, do you want to, Tom, do you want me to send you another link and join one more time? Maybe. I think we need to try that because I cannot see you in the list here.
Okay, Emily, I'm going to go ahead and make you um, presenter so you Great. can get your um, PowerPoint up. That's wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> I don't know what is going on with Tom. I'm like trying everything with him and I can't get him on this call. That's so weird. Sometimes it happens. I know, but it's like, I feel unsolvable. <laughs> I have, I don't have the tools to solve it. <laughs> awesome. I can see your PowerPoint and it's up to you if you want to use your webcam or not. Um, I'll leave it up to you. Hi. <laughs> it's interesting. I don't have the option for the webcam until you made me a presenter. Yeah, I did. I did also put you into as a panelist too. I did switch mm -hmm. that around during the break. Okay. So, um, right. Yeah, I did that with Stacy and a couple others. Yep. Yeah. So. Cool. Like a whole nother toolbar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, we'll go up in a second here. All right, so we're almost here at a quarter before the hour. So just to kind of keep us on time. So um, now we're gonna do kind of some bigger blocks of presentations um, over the next little bit here. So if you do have specific questions, um, Let's put those in the, the question or the chat box, depending on what you see there, and we'll do our best to, to answer those with the particular speakers. Um, yeah, and with that, I guess I will hand it over to you, Emily, to update us on the Asian CARP Technical Committee. Thank you so much for joining us. So yeah, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, it's been really great hearing all the updates and what I like so much is that I'm hearing all the pieces that I'm going to talk about uh, being presented by the state partner. So hopefully uh, some you'll be able to see how those pieces that Asian CARP work that is being done across the basin, how it feeds into this greater Missouri River Basin effort. Oh, how do I think now? Okay. I always like to start off with a little bit of a timeline to show where we've come from and where we're at. Uh, so in 2007 is when the national plan was finalized. Uh, funding has come from various sources over the last years, including the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, O'Gleary and WERDA, which we'll hear more about later from Clayton. Um, and then also just through appropriation funding, which is what happened in 2020 uh, when there was a 25 million increase for Asian carp for, uh, through the Fish and Wildlife Service. Going forward in FY21, we're not exactly sure of what the funding amount will be, but as of right now, the guidance from our leadership is just the plan for flat funding. But also build in scalability to our projects uh, in case there is any kind of change because there's a lot of uncertainty there still. And so uh, a while ago, the uh, Asian CARP structure uh, decided to follow that of the MICRA or the Mississippi Interstate Cooperative Resource Association structure, where it breaks the whole Mississippi River Basin into sub-basins and uh, there's various groups that um, lead the effort in those sub-basins. In the Missouri River Basin, we have the Missouri River Natural Resources Committee. And so the Asian CARP Committee, uh, technical committee that I'm presenting for on behalf of today, is part of the Missouri River Natural Resources Committee. And then that feeds up into MICRA, uh, so the greater Mississippi River Basin structure. And so funding is allocated from Fish and Wildlife Service to those sub-basins, as MICRA has designated. And as you can see, this was how the increase of 25 million with 14 million going out to state partners 
in those sub-basins. And so the Missouri River Basin was allocated 1.1 million for FY20. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, support structure for supporting all of the money going out and the work that's being done also supports the microstructure. And so you'll see the Missouri River Basin there oops, uh, is supported by having a Fish and Wildlife Service coordinator, and that's my position. And then we also have Fish and Wildlife Service grant managers, which myself and Joanne Grady uh, have, are doing for the Missouri River Basin. And that structure is mimicked in all the other sub-basins of the Mississippi River. So this is an allocation table from FY20. And I'm not going to get hooked uh, or caught up in all of the specific numbers. But what I really want to show is that <laughs> in that in those allocations, um, this year or in FY20, there was 56% of the total 25 million that came to the Fish and Wildlife Service was went out to state partners and grants. And in the past, that had only been around the 25, 26%. So we saw a significant increase in the amount of money that was passed through to our state partners to do on the ground work for Asian carp management and control. Also to to just point out those FWS operations, you know, Joanne spoke to how some of her, how some of um, the folks that are on this call today in FWICO's out field offices out in the in the Missouri River Basin are participating and supporting Asian carp priority efforts. Uh, and so that's another way that we leverage funds for Fish and Wildlife Service and the state. So when we got the word that the uh, funding had been increased for FY20 to the, the whole Missouri River Basin, as well as some other new, new basins um, in the greater Mississippi River Basin, we went back to our priority themes that we had identified among our technical groups. So we completed our framework document in 2018. And in the process of completing that framework, uh, we continue those conversations about what activities would be priority. What would we want to address first if, when we got the funding to do so? And so we came up with a laundry list of all of these activities that were high priority. But when, when we really started to pick out the commonalities, three themes really came about. And those were to define the population, the, the spatial distribution of the, of the um, species in the Missouri River Basin, as well as describe the demographics of the populations. Another theme that came out was making sure that we apply some management actions, but be sure that we apply them in the correct location. So making sure that the, um, the need for the management action and what management action we put onto the landscape fits the space and the, and the populations that we're trying to manage. And the other part was, of course, communication. Communicating internally with ourselves, the partners uh, that are involved in the Asian Carp Tech Committee, but also communicating externally to our citizens, the, the people who are using the resources, so that we can emphasize and teach them about the um, importance of managing this invasive species in the Missouri River. So those were our three themes. So as we found out that we got the funding for FY20, we immediately went back to our priority themes and were able to pick out priority activities. And then we uh, identified some, some projects. And those projects, very broadly, uh, we have four of them. We identified four projects, and each of those have various objectives, which I'll get into. Um, but we developed these projects collaboratively among basin partners. So when you hear about Kansas talking about their efforts to uh, control the population in the Kansas River. There's also another uh, another activity being done by the state of Missouri that's also addressing uh, some some very similar activity or or objectives. So I hope to provide some uh, synthesis of how all of those activities are connected uh, under the Missouri River Basin Tech Committee. So overall, with our 1.1 million in funding. Uh, we had we had those four projects, and then five of the ten states in our partnership 
submitted grant, grant applications. And so we were able to provide funding uh, to five states through this effort. Oops. Okay, so the first project is define the spatial distribution and population demographics of Asian carp populations and the associated fish community. So you see how this directly relates to our uh, theme of defining populations. Uh, on the left there, you see all of the, the cooperating agencies. Again, many of them presented some of their activities today. I'll just give some highlight of one of the activities is using eDNA or developing the process of eDNA for the detection of Asian carp in the Missouri River Basin. Um, other groups, uh, including Nebraska, Missouri, uh, are going out and, and then also collaborating federal agencies, the Fish and Wildlife Service, are going out and um, actually doing fisheries independent, very uh, fundamental fishery sampling. And then there was also development of a computer-based application to identify Asian carp eggs. So those are the activities that are funded under this project or supported. Um, and they have a list of of deliverables, but we're really hoping to find out where is that is that line between presence, absence of carp, and then where we have carp, whether uh, silver or big head, our primary um, target species at this time. Uh, what does what do those populations look like? Size, structure, condition, um, and mortality estimates, age structures, those types of things. Many of these projects, I'm just going to say now, are going to be continued into future years. So this is just year one. Uh, we're just now getting to the point of implementing these projects. And so they will most likely be continuing for a, a couple years as we refine and get our protocols, protocols into place and then get data back that can actually inform our future process. And I have a little bit of data. This is the fun part to show folks is, uh, so the Columbia Fish and Wildlife Service Office actually is participating in, um, was able to get out and do a little bit of a pilot study this year. And this is some very preliminary data from our efforts in over the summer. And uh, we, are, we developed a, a novel technique called uh, an electrified dozer trawl. It's similar to a push trawl. It's similar to conventional electrofishing, uh, but it's the combination of the two. And so it, um, uh, and so we're using that to sample um, Asian carp populations in tributaries. And so this is some preliminary data from the summer. And what I want to point out here is the uh, detection of this of this of this year class of this size class in the data. And the reason I want to point that out is because oh, there's a picture of of the fish um, that we were collecting, and so there's that that size class that really has not been seen in some of our previous work, uh, or it has been seen in very low numbers. And so this will be interesting once we get that full data set in to see to interpret what that means by having that that size class show up so significantly in our samples. Um, so that's just a, a little snippet of some information that could be coming from the full implementation of our, our projects. Uh, moving on to project two, we have uh, the Asian carp movement and habitat use in the Missouri River Basin to inform containment and control management actions. And so this is essentially using telemetry to identify uh, when when Asian carp, specifically big-headed carp, silver carp, and big-headed carp, are moving into tributaries? Uh, at least that's one of the, the questions. The other question that we're looking to um, inform with this one is how those fish that are tagged are interacting with some of our barriers. Uh, Nick Fronauer mentioned the electric barrier that's at um, the Iowa Great Lakes and some other areas, and so the, the, that is a specific component of this project where we're looking at the movement and the behavior of those fish in reaction to that electric barrier. Um, other barriers include some in South Dakota and North Dakota. And then we have, we're going to have stationary telemetry receivers at nine tri tributary confl confluences. 
to look at that movement between main stem and uh, tributaries. And this project is, it, it's definitely to inform those management actions so we can know when the fish are in the tributaries, when they are in the places that we may be able to implement management actions to best manage the population. But it's also most likely going to help us build those demographic uh, monitoring efforts. So to understand when the fish are moving or when the fish are present in certain areas will help us determine um, when and if we can use those habitats to sample the population and learn more about them. Moving on to project number three. This one is our control and containment of invasive carp in the Missouri River Basin. Very focused on those man implementing those management actions. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, and as Chris explained, that uh, Kansas is uh, an active participant in this. And Kara also mentioned how Missouri Department of Conservation is participating in this, in this uh, particular project. And then Fish and Wildlife Service in Columbia is also participating. And so uh, in Kansas, there's gonna be contracted removal of Asian carp. We're gonna contract a commercial fisher to go into an area um, where there is potential for that population to move upstream into areas uh, where we don't typically see them, at least not at very high densities or, on very, or, or very often, very low occurrence of them. Um, but then there's also the component that's looking to explore what other options do we have for control and containment of carp in the basin? You know, can is removal feasible? If we if it is feasible, what kind of techniques are needed? How much effort is needed? So that's another component of this. And project four, uh, again, as Chris mentioned, is uh, just doing a feasibility study on what a barrier would look like at that Bowersock Dam. And since he spoke about it, I won't, I won't go into more. So moving forward, um, the projects that I just explained, they were funded in FY20, and they're going to be fully implemented in FY21, hopefully. Uh, in FY21, we're planning for flat funding, so $1.1 million to the Missouri River Basin. However, we are also keeping things flexible and scalable in the event that we do need to adjust. Could be more money, could be less money, could be right at the same. Uh, many, of, many components of the projects I just explained are gonna continue into FY21, probably FY22. I, I would expect some of them are, are going to be for three to five years as we get information, um, as we learn from those and continue to uh, refine those protocols. That's my dog. Uh, and then, uh, so what we're doing right now is we're prioritizing activities that could potentially receive or be eligible for funding in FY21. I estimate that we'll have $500,000 available for, uh, to fund states to address those high priority uh, activities. Um, that could be, that, that number is a little bit variable depending on, again, how much funding we'll get moving forward, but also what uh, states that are doing current projects, what they'll need to continue their efforts. After we get that list of prioritized activities, we will go into developing proposals collaboratively. And what that means is that state, federal, university partners work together to put together those proposals. I'm, I'm running a little bit low on my time, so uh, I just wanted to touch back to our themes and that if you rec if you notice in our um, in our last round of funding in FY20, we did not have any projects that addressed our communication. Uh, so I'll just uh, want to point out that this year there are four potential priorities for communication. And they range from, as you can see here, the doing uh, data management is a big priority of this group, making sure that we're all collecting our data in a comparable method so that we can synthesize it at the Missouri River Basin level, uh, as well as it can be accessible by multiple partners. Uh, there's been some talk of doing some angler satisfaction surveys in select areas. We want to host some conference symposia so that we can learn from each other with all of this effort that's going on to the ground. 
uh, and we want to develop some cohesive messaging. And there's some other projects that are going on or are proposed that just proposed at this time. If you're interested in reviewing these further and you're not already on our um, email list, I encourage you to get a hold of me. You know, this group is was my first introduction to Missouri River ANS uh, management and control. And I have continued to come to the members of this group because of your expertise and experience. And to have some of you already participating on the Missouri River Asian Carp Technical Committee has really, I think, been fundamental to our success so far. Um, and so I'm thankful for that. Thank you so much for continuing to be a part of it. Um, but also for those of you who aren't already involved in Missouri River Asian Carp work, you have an interest, please reach out to me or let me know. Um, I have also put on here two website links, the microrivers.org and the asiancarp.org, where you can find past documents, you can see what, what's happening in the Missouri River Basin, as well as other basins um, for projects, deliverables, proposed activities. So I encourage you to check out those websites if you have an interest in learning more. And with that, I will take any questions. Great, Emily. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the box, do we? If you have a question, um, I guess either put in the little question box or maybe unmute yourself for Emily at this moment, because I think we have just a, a minute to spare. Um, otherwise, we will go to our next speaker. Let's see, I still no questions or chat. Okay, super. Well, thank you so much, Emily. Welcome. Joining. Um, let's see. Now we are going to have Stacy present, and Stacy, I've just handed over the the controls to you. Good morning. Well, all now it's afternoon. It's twelve oh five here in Montana. <laughs> Hi, Stacy. Hi. Hi. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, I can. You are good to go. I am going to disappear. <laughs> the stage is yours. Thank you, Leah. Okay, so, oh crap, now I can only see me. That's not what I want. There we go. Okay, so uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Stacy Schmidt with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Um, I'm the manager of our AIS laboratory. Um, so this is an update on all of that for you. If I can get it to work. There we go. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the lab, a little background. So we process samples for uh, ourselves internally and some of the Missouri River Basin states um, the primary focus of the lab is early detection of dreissenid mussels, although we did have done some corbicula work as well. Um, we're also processing samples like Joanne mentioned for um, national fish hatcheries, and we serve in a confirmatory role for pretty much anyone that needs it. Um, as of right now, we don't charge for any of these services and funding for this is provided by Fish and Wildlife Service, FWP, and the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, the staff, for those of you that don't know, and I think both of them are on the call right now, um, Jane Duckworth is uh, in charge of our Kalispell lab and Keegan Efforts is in charge of our Helena lab, and they have both been slaving away trying to get caught up um, on the never ending stream of samples. So a recap of 2020, um, I'll mention it a few times. We've been understaffed for a few years. Um, we've also been increasing our sample load uh, every single season. Um, so we've been trying to come up with creative ways of keeping our staff sane as well as uh, 
keeping up with the turnaround time on the samples, keeping up with our with our data entry, changing roles and responsibilities within um, our program, um, as well as looking at infrastructure. And then I've got a little chart there on kind of a snapshot of where we're at with samples as of about a week ago. So challenges, again, understaffed. Um, because of everything that happened in 2020, we had a lot of issues with um, kind of changing how we operate due to uh, us still doing all of our normal work, um, but kind of being limited in the lab. Um, so we've had to close, close the lab a few times because of staff being quarantined. Um, that caused a backup of samples early on in the season that we just haven't really been able to get ahead of yet. Um, the lab had to be decontaminated. All of our lab spaces right now, we currently share with other uh, FWP staff. So here in Helena, we share a space with the pollution folks. And then Jaden and Kalispell has been dealing with chronic wasting disease technicians kind of pushing him out. Um, so these are all issues we're, we're working on. Um, so 2020 has been a difficult season, as maybe you have seen from the state updates, all still waiting on sample results from us. So what we're working on right now, um, because we're understaffed, so uh, we've had a vacancy um, recently, so right now we're working on, we've rewritten all of the position descriptions for the lab staff. Those are currently being reclassified by the state. When that's done, uh, my intention is to uh, hire um, a permanent position who is, um, that position is uh, temporarily filled right now by Keegan. Um, and then uh, hopefully by, uh, Early next year will be fully staffed, although probably not fully trained until new staff get at least a year under their belt, but we should be better off than we have been in a while. Picture about numbers, um, something I've been talking about for the last few years, at least at this meeting, is kind of how we're either at or over capacity for what we can handle. Um, we did expand in 2017. We've built a new lab space, um, we've hired new staff, um, but we're still just barely keeping up, um, and this year not keeping up. Um, so that's certainly something to consider as we move forward, and so I've got some things to talk about regarding that um, as far as um, maybe some means to mitigate the sample load. Um, similar to what we've done in, in Montana. So right now, this is kind of where you're looking and I've had some calls from state coordinators wondering what's going on. The Internally, we prioritized our hatcheries. So all Montana samples coming into the lab get prioritized and categorized and the turnaround time depends on the priority. So the risk fives, are the highest priority, so they get processed the quickly, and that includes any out-of-state samples that get prioritized as a high priority. Um, so those are the ones that are going to get done more quickly. However, that also means we have a lot of samples that are going to get done much slower, and those are the the ones and twos. And so, in anticipation of a this happening this season and us being understaffed this year, we sh we con contracted out a lot of those ones and twos, and those were all samples that we collected ourselves, not partner collected samples, just to get them off the shelf to free up our uh, lab technicians' time to work on your samples as well as our own internal high priority stuff. Um, so that's what that looks like. So I've highlighted kind of the categories of samples that are we're the most behind on. So right now those turnaround times look okay or decent, but they're gonna actually end up being a lot slower because those samples aren't completed yet. So once they do get completed, that turnaround time will slow down significantly. Um, so 
just a breakdown on each state individually. So in that 3C category that we have, um, all the out-of-state samples are, this is kind of where we're sitting with all of those. Again, um, we're kind of right now delving into most of these. So these should start getting done um, pretty quickly. And like Craig mentioned during Tom's discussion, um, we're hoping to get these done you know, by early next year. Um, but, you know, holidays are coming up. Who knows what's going to happen with the pandemic? No guarantees. We will try our hardest. So something to think about um, is we are have had some internal discussions on uh, capping numbers of samples. And this is based on what states have sent us in the past. Um, kind of with a bias towards more recent years because those years are much higher than when we first started. So this is kind of what we were thinking, putting a cap on kind of what we can handle with our infrastructure and with our staff and with our equipment as it stands right now. Um, we should have a better idea after next year what this will look like because we will be closer to fully staffed. Um, maybe not as experienced, but we should have at least two people working consistently next year. Um, so this is what we're proposing um, as a cap on samples. And then I looked very, very quickly um, at the potential for maybe doing something similar for the Missouri River Basin as a whole and collectively um, something that could be helpful is maybe if we, um, this group specifically, were able to prioritize Missouri River Basin waters as a whole so that should something like this year happen or and or to get samples kind of moving along more efficiently now this year because we are behind, um, if we were to prioritize uh, Missouri River Basin waters collectively from the group so that we could uh, maybe get some of those high priority waters done a little more quickly. Because um, right now, all of the out of state samples kind of sit in the same category. So those are going to get processed uh, in the order uh, kind of received. And this, um, this table I just threw together based on numbers of samples that we got. Um, so it's a little biased because Nebraska sends us composite samples and it's an alphabetical order, but um, it does kind of give us an idea of maybe some potential high priority water bodies. So that's certainly something to discuss and think about if you guys think it would be helpful. Um, we've discussed it internally and think it could be a possible solution to um, years like this year where we get behind. Um, so something to put on the docket to talk about. Other plans for 2021. So we're right now working on cross training one of our seasonal sampling um, technicians to help in the lab. He's been working for a couple of weeks. He's doing really well. Um, we're hoping that will help get stuff um, off the shelves in the next couple months. We're also talking about um, working on a better infrastructure within the lab um, continuing to contract out our own lower priority samples. And then um, also looking at capping samples for our Montana partners, because that seems to be where there's the most dramatic increase from year to year. Um, and then also, should it come to that, look at the need for additional lab space, staff equipment, all that kind of stuff. Um, I do have a link in here. Um, Keegan was featured on one of our Wildlife Wednesdays. It's on the Montana Wild Facebook page if you're interested. Did a great job. So kind of a little snippet of information from our lab directly from our lab staff. He did a great job. A um, couple of notes from the lab. Uh, just reminders, if you're able to use Nalgene bottles, they are a little more expensive to acquire, but they leak very infrequently when they're secured properly. Um, 
and a reminder to send smaller shipments versus large shipments just to keep things moving along. And I know there's been a lot of turnover in AIS programs, so just keep us posted on who you want your contact person to be for that state. And if any water body status changes, um, let us know so that we're aware of that, those changes. Um, I'd like to thank you to Gail Johnson. Um, she retired in October. She has been uh, instrumental in getting our lab to where it is today. And we cannot thank her enough for her 10 years of service to the lab. So thanks to Gail. And I believe that is all I have. So feel free to get a hold of me if you have any questions. And I will turn it back over to Leah. Great, thank you, Stacey. That was wonderful. Um, we probably, I don't see any questions or feedback, but I was kind of thinking specifically, maybe folks want to think about the um, the comment that Stacy made, made about prioritizing waters and sampling from the basin. And we can probably cover a little bit of that after um, all of the speakers go as well. But if you don't get your answer, Stacy, I'm sure we can, um, I don't know, I'm sure there's other ways to get some dialogue going, because that sounds like it would be very helpful for you to help with prioritization, et cetera. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So please, as we're as we continue here with the agenda, just keep that in mind, what Stacy had mentioned, and, and let's try to touch on that in a little bit here. Uh, okay. So Chris, you are next with sharing the stage here with um with Tom, and I'm hoping that we can have Tom. So, Chris, I've just made you presenter. And, Tom, I see you are unmuted. Great. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes. <laughs> now I can't hear Chris. Oh, Chris. <laughs> okay, Chris, how about you? Are you out there? Yeah, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yay, technology is shining down on us in favoritism. Excellent. Okay, Chris, it's up to you if you want to show your webcam or not, but I can see your PowerPoint. So go ahead as you see fit, and I will uh, again. I, I, I can't actually see my PowerPoint at the moment. How do I pull that? All I see is you. How do I pull that back up? Oh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. There. Is that better? Now I, now I can see it. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead when you're ready. Okay. Uh, so this section, um, just at, at the moment, we have a whole lot of new coordinators in the basin. Um, and so I am the, the coordinator in Kansas, and I'm, I consider myself relatively new yet. Um, I've been in this position four years. And so um, the idea for this was just um, looking back on my own experience, kind of what would have been helpful um, for me in, in my first couple of years to just kind of understand the background of um, ANS and the coordination groups that exist and and all the documents and and things that um, nobody else internally in my my agency could teach me about and that um, would have really helped speed up my my understanding of the issues and and what's going on in the world of ANS and so um, the idea here is you know we're just going to kind of walk through um, some of the information that I hope will help you guys out and. Um, I'm going to start. Tom's going to present a little more at the end, but the whole goal here is just to get information to um, the other coordinators in the base and hopefully kind of an organized fashion. Um, so um, just starting real generally, this is something that actually ends up in a lot of my presentations is, you know, just what are ANS or AIS? Um, and then some of the, the federal legislation and regulation that um, a coordinator should be aware of. 
Um, so I'm not going to go through specifically what these are. I'm just going to put them here and leave them here. Um, I sent a PDF of this presentation earlier, um, along with some other documents in a zip drive. So um, everything I share here, you should have in, in that email as well. Um, I can't get it to uh, move forward here. Um, well, let's see. Well, you're still presenter, Chris. Um, Do you have multiple screens going? I do not. Huh. This is weird. <laughs> do you want to? Yeah, if you just want to move forward, I can you move my slide? Um. I don't know. I just click to share with you. Does that work for you? Possibly. Let's see here. I haven't done this before, so this is fun. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure how we ended up here. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Let's see here. <sighs> Let me try making taking you off presenter and making you presenter again. How about that? Okay. Oh, geez, that didn't help make anything better. Chris, did you send the PowerPoint to me? You Sorry. Said you did. I just you got back in. Okay. Okay. Did you say you I, I could try to pull the PowerPoint up, I guess, alternatively, but I just I can't seem to find you now that I dismissed you. Oh, there you are. Sorry about this, guys. Thank you for your patience. So try sharing your screen again there. I can see it. There you go. Well done. You can see yep. me moving it too? Yep, yep. Okay. I can see you. Go ahead. OK, so some of these are, are borrowed slides from the, the Western Regional Panel. So um, I apologize. We don't have the information for the entire Missouri River Basin. So um, Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, you're missing here. but. I think these these maps do a really good job of kind of laying the, the background of um, where a lot of the, the the states in the basin are. So um, this is full time employees in the the ANS programs in the basin. Um, you know the general trend here is as you move west, um, the programs are larger and also well more well funded. So um, you know this center group of central flyway states here you know north dakota to, to kansas we're we're kind of on the lower end of um the budgets in in the region and i suspect that this um trend kind of follows as you go east minnesota obviously um is different their their budgets um really um large so um and you can see these western states a lot of the money is going to the the watercraft inspection the the wid programs 
And so I, I mentioned this in my update, but how these states are, are doing this and building these budgets, um, a, a substantial portion of that is through these extra boater fees for aquatic nuisance species. Um, again, this map is a, a year old. Um, so North Dakota, you know, will be green now. They've got their, their extra boater fee in place. Um, and this is something that um, here in Kansas we're pursuing as well. And so it's really well organized, the, the whole WID process. Um, you know, these states um, may operate um, a lot of different ways, but in general, they're sharing the information. So all these green states, um, and, and Kansas will be green next year too, are, are states that are doing WID and, and entering the data in this shared database. So um, it really increases the power of that information for us as well. And so overall, um, this is um, more or less the, the current view of the zebra mussel situation in the country. Um, red dots are zebra or quagga mussel infestations uh, and blue dots are um, wid inspection areas. So, um, you know, I think Mike mentioned uh, drinking the Kool-Aid earlier. Um, it's probably not a bad idea. The, the, the wid programs in the West are um, appear to be very successful in, in keeping the, the spread of mussels out of those states. So um, I think it's a successful program and, and something that um, other states, if they're capable, should be working on as well. Um, and then silver carp, this is kind of a, a more downstream issue within the Missouri River Basin. Um, I didn't include for a map for big head carp, but the ranges are very similar. Um, you know, the lower Missouri River has a lot of carp as you move upstream. Um, they are in the, the connected areas and, until they reach some sort of barrier. Um, and I just want to touch on, um, for, the, for the new people, um, in the world of ANS, we talk in a lot of acronyms and we talk about groups and, and um, this is one thing that, that I really, um, struggled with as a new coordinator is I'd hear these acronyms and and wasn't entirely sure what they are or, or what they did or or who was a part and so I'm just going to touch on uh, several groups here real briefly um, I can't really go into to super um, high level detail of what these groups are doing so um, I apologize if I offend anyone and leave off any sort of really information really good information on a group, but I'm just trying to cover, cover a bunch of these um, kind of quickly here. Um, so the ANSTF is the National ANS Task Force. Um, they are uh, chaired by Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, and they kind of oversee the whole country through the, the regional panel system. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the upper end of the ANS coordination and it breaks down in these smaller groups um, regionally. So um, not everyone in the Missouri River Basin is a member of the WRP, but uh, most of us are. Um, so you can see on the, the graphic here, it's basically um, from North Dakota to Texas and everything west. Um, so 19 states, uh, this is a very active group. Um, they hold an annual meeting every year, sometime in the fall, um, usually October. Uh, we were supposed to be in Alaska this fall, so we're all pretty disappointed that didn't happen. Um, one of the, uh, the the key activities of this group are um, producing documents and guides for um, management and, and coordination of ANS efforts in the West. Um, they have a lot of committees and, and work groups that are very active. Um, certainly something that if you're not a part of, um, you could learn a lot. And so kind of a, a subgroup, um, it's, it's the same states, but this is just the ANS coordinators within these states. It's, it's known as WISCI, um, the Western Invasive Species Coordinating Effort. Um, Allison Zock on the call um, coordinates this group. We have a, a call once a month. Um, and this is a, a more informal group. Um, it's a great place to go if you just have um, questions for other coordinators. How do I do this? How did you do it? Um, what do I need to know here? Um, 
it, it's really kind of a peer-to-peer -peer, um, support group, you know. Um, it, it's a great place to just come um, and discuss projects in your state and, and bounce ideas off of other ANS coordinators. Um, analogous to the WRP, um, as you move east, is the Mississippi River Basin Panel. Uh, there's a fair amount of overlap in the groups, especially within the Missouri River Basin states. Um, this panel is um, kind of the center of the country. Everything that drains into the Mississippi um, is part of this panel. Um, this group meets every nine months. Um, recently, uh, we've been focusing on kind of themed meetings or workshops. You know, we had one on Asian carp sampling, eDNA for managers. Um, the next one was supposed to be kind of fish health focused. Um, so the this group um, is a great place to come for practical knowledge on a on a focused area, as well as just meet the other basin coordinators and um, just learn a lot about what's going on within within your neighboring states. And so another group to be aware of is the Mississippi Interstate Cooperative Resource Association. Um, Emily mentioned this group earlier. Um, member states actually pay dues into this organization. And then, um, you know, this, this group um, kind of coordinates um, activities um, within the, the basin. So this isn't just ANS. Um, typically, your state's representative is your fish chief. Um, so this gives them a place to meet and talk about um, large issues that that cross state boundaries um, in the past paddlefish have been big issues commercial fishing for catfish um, things that a, one state can't tackle on its own um, currently though they are focused on ans and they are um, working towards um, trying to form a mississippi river basin fisheries commission so this would be a um, more analogous to some of the other fisheries commissions around the country and, and hopefully funded to the point that um, the organization could take on larger um, bigger projects and as you can see it's it's organized in the six um, sub basins emily mentioned those earlier as well um, and this is uh, the group emily talked about the missouri river basin asian carp technical committee um, we probably need some sort of acronym for that too. That name's a, a mouthful. Um, so when it comes to Asian carp and in, in, in the basin, um, this is the group you wanna be a part of. Um, and here's the group meeting today is the Missouri River Basin team. Um, you know, this group um, kind of uh, is a little more informal than some of the other groups. Uh, you know, we meet about once a year, kind of as someone volunteers or gets voluntold to organize a meeting. Um, but the the group, one of the strong points is the the, the state updates, the informal discussions. Um, it, it's really a good group to to get to know your neighbors and and what is happening in in this shared watershed. Um, and of course, as mentioned earlier, uh, bowling was was a, an activity this group uh, did annually as well. And I'm going to pass it off here to Tom uh, and let him talk a little bit more about some of these other groups. You should talk more about bowling. <laughs> can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Tom. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Chris, for the opportunity to, to team talk on this. Um, but, so I was asked to kind of just bring it home. Uh, take talk a little bit more about what's going on farther west uh, and then kind of circle back to the idea of coordination and just bringing people together especially for new folks that are new to the AIS issue um, in, in Missouri River Basin states. Um, so uh, the Columbia Basin, Columbia River Basin team um, is coordinated through uh, Pacific States Marine Fisheries and Stephen Phillips. Uh, he's known as the Quagazar uh, as you go farther west, he uh, is a great resource to kind of keep track of what's going on with legislation uh, and also serves as kind of a, a coalescing point where the four Columbia River Basin states and 
uh, British Columbia and Alberta get together to, to coordinate on AIS related issues. Um, Mesa Species Action Network uh, is is the um, what do we call that, Leah? It, it, she facilitates the, or ISEN facilitates those meetings and does a great job just bringing people together twice a year uh, to really compare notes and coordinate on what's going on uh, with prevention activities in the basin, but also uh, national issues, uh, word of funding, all those things. Uh, just a great group of people working together with a common goal of primarily zebra and quagga mussel prevention and early detection, but also multi taxa uh, aquatic invasive species issues. Uh, and westernais.org website, uh, if you haven't been there, there's some great resources on there. Um, I, I encourage you to check that out. Next slide. Other groups that are going, uh, working on AIS issues farther west and I guess um, nationally as well, we have WAFWA, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, that touches on AIS issues. Um, PENWAR is an economic development group uh, with Western state, uh, Northwestern states and provinces, and they have a, a AIS, or, or it's an invasive species subgroup, but their focus has primarily been on things like zebra and quagga mussels. Um, AFWA, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, also is, is touched on aquatic invasive species issues. And specific to Montana, uh, the Upper Columbia Conservation Commission is a, a Montana-based commission uh, that deals with aquatic invasive species issues. Uh, also in Montana, there's Invasive Species Council that deals with AIS issues. So I guess really just driving the point home that there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen with this issue, uh, especially in the Northwest and especially um, in more recent years when more funding has come west related to AIS issues. So it's more important than ever that states really work together. Uh, typically, these programs are implemented at the state level um, with partnerships with federal agencies, um, but typically the boots on the ground are states getting the job done. And, and it's we, we all work together with similar issues and challenges and, and that, that coordination is critical uh, through groups like Whiskey that Chris mentioned, um, but also groups like this Missouri Basin team uh, compare notes and make sure we're we're doing the best job we can out there to, to address the issue. Next slide. Funding opportunities. Uh, I mentioned the amount of money that's coming west nowadays. So through Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, we have our ANS plans. I believe all of us uh, receive funding from now, um, which it, it, the amount has increased uh, significantly over recent years, which is great. Um, QZAP money is also available uh, that Joanne mentioned. Um, so that's going, those awards are gonna be forthcoming here for next season. Uh, and then all the Asian carp funding that uh, continues to, to focus on the carp issue. Um, one thing that we've been working on a lot is this Army Corps of Engineers word of money uh, in the Columbia Basin. It's been three or four years that we've been working under that money. That's a 50-50 match, um, but it's really helped bolster and, and, and encourage additional uh, quagga and zebra mussel prevention uh, and early detection activities uh, in the West. And now that it's going to be available for central states, uh, it's, it's just a great resource to really step up our game to, to be more active and, and uh, work more closely together on prevention activities. That's a great resource. Uh, Reclamation has also provided a significant amount of funding uh, through Safeguarding the West Initiative, uh, and RAWA also provides funding as well. So th there's a lot of money, and with that money comes a lot of attention. Uh, also, a lot of political attention and a lot of people that want to be involved but don't necessarily have much background in the issue. Uh, and, and directing traffic between all the interested parties in this issue is, is something that um, has been a challenge. And, and I think, uh, again, working closely together as states so that through implementation, we, we're really clear on what we're trying to do uh, so that when some of these well meaning groups come in and, and asking, asking to do something, 
um, we can point them in a direction that's more helpful than harmful uh, for getting things done. Next slide. So just a couple key points to bring it home and kind of close the loop on this. Um, there's a lot of great things getting done related to aquatic invasive species in the West. Um, and we have the resources available now to, to do more. Um, it's, there's a lot of experience working on this issue uh, in Western states, and especially for the states that are just coming online with new coordinators or, or having programs with additional funding and authority. Um, we all lean on each other. Everybody's efforts benefits everybody else. And, and it is really important that we, we work together and encourage each other um, to do the best job we can out there. It, when I look at Montana's program now, the biggest threat I see is zebra mussels moving up the Missouri River system. And, and the more I can work with downstream states to, to help encourage action, um, if, if we can uh, provide a letter or uh, just the experience of, of being able to implement a program. Uh, Montana's had a program for over 15 years. Um, so there's a lot of experience, a lot of, been, a lot of things have been learned through trial and error when we talk about watercraft inspection in particular, um, but also with our monitoring program and, and our outreach activities. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge here. And, and it, for new states coming online or, or new coordinators, uh, being willing to ask for help or input um, there's a lot of resources there, and we absolutely would, would enjoy the opportunity to work with you closely um, if you have questions or needs, uh, because, uh, again, any efforts that are going on in the basin have help our neighbors, and it, it's really important. So um, that's all I had. Um, thank you for the opportunity, and I apologize for my technical challenges here right off the bat. Thanks, Chris and Tom. That was that was great. Um, I feel like there's definitely there there's many people um, that I think would identify themselves myself as one. I'd like to think that if you have a question on AIS, hopefully I if I don't know the answer. Not I'm not saying I know all the answers, but I can find the person that knows the answer. So I would encourage you know I like the idea of keeping the communication lines open. I think that benefits everybody. So, um, yeah, are there any questions at this time for Chris or Tom? Um, like Chris mentioned, he shared all this stuff um, with you guys. So um, if there's something, particularly some of the legislative stuff or some of those links, um, I think that should be available to you if you had any follow-up or other questions. So. Alrighty then. Well, if there are no questions here, it looks like Clayton, you are next and I have shared the screen with you and you are unmuted. Perfect. So Clayton with the um, U.S. Army Corps is going to be talking a little bit about WERDA, uh, the Water Resource Development Act. I'm going to be mindful of my acronyms. And then uh, Stephen Phillips will also be chiming in um, after Clayton is done. So Clayton, feel free to go ahead and start talking. Okay, yeah, thank you. So first, uh, the obligatory, can you hear me now, uh, plea, right? Yes, I can hear you. Very good. Okay, <laughs> very good. Uh, well, thank you for the invitation to come and, and provide uh, uh, an update uh, and some background on the, the work that <clears throat> we here in the, the Omaha Army Corps of Engineers District have been working on. Stephen talked uh, to kick off this meeting. Stephen Phillips talked a little bit about the WERDA uh, 2018 bill, but so I'm going to give you a little bit more of a specific uh, update for the Upper Missouri River Basin uh, on this WERDA expansion. And uh, so uh, I want to do that by first just briefly touching on the authority language that was uh, that was handed down to us from Congress. Uh, and effectively, again, and this is the 2018 word, effectively Congress told or said that the federal government uh, shall establish and operate, maintain new or existing watercraft inspection stations <clears throat> uh, in the Columbia River Basin, which that, that work is 
uh, you probably are all aware of that's, that's been done. Uh, but then that expanded into the uh, the Upper Missouri River Basin and the uh, the Colorado River Basin and also the South Platte uh, River Basin, effectively like the Denver metro area, I think was a focus there. Uh, and not the Arizona River Basin, but the Arkansas River Basin. I think there was a typo in the in the in the legislation. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a brief update on what the what we've been doing in the Missouri River Basin, uh, but also know that uh, we're working in parallel simultaneously on the South Platte Basin as well uh, to to get these um, authorities processed and and get the NEPA documents written. Um, but the the big picture point here is that the uh, that these cost share programs are, are across the board going to be 50-50 split, so 50% state, 50% federal. Um, and with any um, Corps of Engineers planning process for us, we have an important thing to point out is the the purpose and the need uh, for for a, uh, for any federal action, really. Um, and so in this case, uh, we decide our purpose is to assist states in the upper Missouri River Basin um, with uh, establishing and expanding uh, watercraft inspection stations to aid in preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species. Um, and it's needed because uh, th there is significant potential for damage, which everybody on the phone I think is aware of, uh, to uh, uh, federal infrastructure. And so this this represents the federal interest and in the nexus for uh, for the federal government to be involved, um, <clears throat> specifically with the Corps of Engineers on the Missouri River. Uh, uh, as there's a direct risk and threat to uh, authorized purposes. I think on the Missouri River there's eight authorized purposes, and I think you could make a pretty good case for all eight being impacted uh, due to an infestation of. Uh, uh, zebra and quagga mussels, but specifically uh, we've, we've highlighted hydropower, navigation, um, <clears throat> water supply, and then of course fish and wildlife and mitigation associated with that. Uh, and so uh, to further kind of bring home the point of the need for this work, um, this uh, I think the need is clear in this distribution map uh, uh, is is pretty useful in visualizing that. So um, <clears throat> these uh, zebra quagga mussel, zebra and quagga mussels were first discovered in the Great Lakes in the 1980s, and then uh, have spread throughout most of the East. And uh, in as of 2019, December of 2019, this is what the the established population uh, distribution map looks like. Um, again, uh, I think. Chris in the previous talk talked about the uninfested West and and that's what we're here. Um, that's why I'm involved in this is to help ensure that we can keep keep that as a uh, an important key phrase or a catchphrase to keep the keep the West uninfested. So <clears throat> policymakers recognize that as an important piece. Uh, they recognize that watercraft inspection stations uh, and the efforts that are that are ongoing are, are an important first uh, front line uh, sort of defense. Um, and so, to to help keep um, the growing concern of uh, zebra and quaggles, quagga mussels uh, from from spreading, or um, wanted, wanted to focus more on. Uh, expanding those inspection efforts. Um, currently, water inspection, watercraft inspection programs are operated by the states. Um, and as you are all aware, in listening to several of the uh, updates earlier in the meeting today, um, um, recognize that that's a that's a key focus for this group. Um, finding out that that a lot of there's a quite a range of options and opportunities for the types of stations. There's, there's roadside inspection stations, ramp side inspection stations, several roving inspection stations, and then also uh, a lot of resource agency offices are performing inspections uh, on, I think, kind of a regularly scheduled 
uh, both regularly scheduled and by even by appointment. So if you're traveling to a new state or a new area, uh, I think you can call up um, a resource agency office and in, in like in Wyoming, I think, and set up a uh, an inspection. As it's been already uh, talked about quite a bit, the WID program uh, is is very valuable and a powerful tool and um, it sounds like more and more states are starting to adopt that um, that uh, uh, that database and model. <clears throat> so our approach uh, uh, for uh, expanding to the Upper Missouri River Basin has been to coordinate with the states uh, and to assist and support the states in developing um, their plans, uh, developing plans for, for increasing efforts for inspection stations and to um, develop plans that adapt to changing information. So, uh, you know, information changes like uh, new identified threats, there's new emerging technologies that are becoming more available and we, we anticipate that will even continue further into the future. Um, with uh, uh, more automated systems um, that maybe don't necessarily require a, a uh, an attendant to be present at all times uh, for inspections and decan decontaminations, um, and then also adapting to like shifting resources and um, uh, you know I want to say political influences, but uh, you know as administrations change over the years, they'll be different. There'll be varying levels of uh, emphasis, I'm sure. And so, this coordinating effort is is manifesting for is manifesting into what we're calling it's a uh, an integrated planning and NEPA document. Uh, we're calling it it's a an integrated letter report. So this includes both the plan, the planning component, and covers the NEPA uh, coverage. Um, that's what we're working on right now to finish up and get through the get through the, uh, the required NEPA requirements uh, to get to uh, get the uh, cost share program off and going in the in the Upper Missouri River Basin. So I'll give you a quick um, overview of the the kinds of actions that can be covered or that would fit within the reimbursable the cost share program. Uh, we start. They started with uh, 15 different measures, and so each measure you can sort of think of as a, an action type. Um, I don't want to read through all of them here, but I'll try to highlight a couple. And like measure number two is increase the number of water inspection station, watercraft inspection stations, and then extending the hours of operations for those, and even including some nighttime uh, inspection uh, resources. Um, it was uh, highlighted earlier, the addition of K9 detection capabilities, that's that's included in this. So the idea here was to uh, be uh, open and liberal and make sure that we can include, we included as much as we could think of um, uh, for, uh, for the NEPA coverage. Um, there was a question that was brought up to me early on about um, activities that would fit into the reimbursable pro program, and one was um, <clears throat> uh, like the question was, would it fit under measure number seven, the increasing public awareness and education, and and uh, getting public buy-in and involvement? Um, there, you know, things like road signage, um, some educational materials like pamphlets would be reimbursable, but but uh, like um, bigger. Let's see how to say this. Bigger ticket items, maybe like a, a lottery, uh, encouraging folks to stop for a inspection and prom and and putting them into a lottery to win something like I don't know a boat or some other big ticket item. Um, <clears throat> didn't sound like that was something that would be uh, on a, a reimbursable item. Um, so <clears throat> ultimately, the the goal here with these um, measures that, that then ultimately would roll into uh, um, the alternative for the NEPA analysis was to be, was to provide adaptability. 
And so being adaptive was absolutely a key word. We carried all these proposed measures forward with the exception of measure number eight. We didn't feel it was necessary to, we didn't want to require watercraft inspections, but certainly they are, uh, they are encouraged. Um, so I'll talk briefly about, I'll talk briefly about the, uh, the logistics here and give, give a little bit of detail on the, the type of, um, particulars the with the NEPA side of things what we're looking at so again I said it's a it's a considered a letter report and a programmatic environmental assessment which included uh, collecting existing conditions data uh, which I've got kind of on the right side of the screen there's an example um, a map of the state of Wyoming and their 2019 um, inspection station efforts and they've got them broken out into three different categories it looks like uh, throughout the state. So information like that was is is used, and uh, we're also looking at <clears throat> making sure we're in compliance with with all the other environmental laws. Uh, we've got people working on the tribal and cultural coordination, and then there'll be a, uh, a it's typical with any NEPA process a public comment and review period, which our standard is a 30 day, um, and not sure if we're going to stick with that 30 days. So for a, an environmental assessment, it's not clearly defined, I guess, I guess in the in the NEPA regs. Uh, there may be an option to go to a 15-day review period. And again, the idea is to to get this uh, get this approved and signed uh, up through our uh, USACE Army Corps of Engineers headquarters and and get the the uh, reimbursable program started and going. So again, to summarize, the uh, <clears throat> the cost share uh, is authorized at 50% uh, state, 50% federal. Uh, we're anticipating the to operate on the calendar year, so like January to January versus the federal the federal uh, uh, fiscal year. Um, so that'll be important for the states to to track and follow. And that's important because the states we're anticipating it looks like the states will develop uh, scopes of work and define their own tasks and deliverables, uh, and then submit those to uh, submit those to the I think probably the core. We haven't quite worked that out yet for the Upper Missouri Basin, but um, and so that'll be important to to develop those scopes of works because looking forward and sort of reading the tea leaves uh, and especially based on a lot of the updates from the states that we've heard today um, this is a, a a rapidly growing and emerging um, need right funding for aquatic invasive species so if the if there comes a point that um, the cost share requests coming in from the states were to exceed the appropriations from congress there would likely or potentially be a screening and prioritization process uh, that would have to probably be put in place because uh, well, the Congress may not appropriate enough money to cover uh, the full amount that's requested by the states. And so um, I could see a scenario playing out where um, you know the state developed scope of work and plans uh, would would uh, play a significant role in in um, in uh, I guess awarding those awarding those contracts or awarding those funds. Uh, and that said as well, um, coordination amongst the states uh, it would also represent another way to like improve efficiency and and prioritize uh, efforts and needs. Uh, so with that, I think Stephen Phillips wanted to give a few words as well. Um, we haven't gone over too late. Um, here's my contact information uh, with a uh, phone number and email. Uh, if anybody has questions or suggestions or thoughts, uh, feel free to reach out. And I'll turn it over to Stephen and or back to Leah. Great, Clayton. Thank you. No, you're good on time. I think we have some flexibility. <laughs> Have a few technical flips. So um, let's see, Stephen, I am going to make you presenter.
Oh, sorry. Hey, can y'all still hear me? This is Clayton. Yes. Yep. Yes. I wanted to make I wanted to make one more uh, comment. Or I had a meeting this morning with uh, my vertical chain in the core, and <clears throat> or it looks like we're aiming for sometime in May or towards the end of May for uh, this entire cost share for the Upper Missouri and the South Platte to be completed, signed, and ready to ready to implement. Uh, I, I anticipate that was going to be a question at some point. So to me, if anybody did wonder, uh, right now we're aiming for uh, the May timeframe. Great. Willing, no COVID delays. Great, good news. So Stephen, I can see your screen, but it looks like double PowerPoints. Hang on. How's that? Great. There you go. Looks good. Okay. All right, here we go. Um, this will be a legislative update. Thanks to Clayton for some uh, background on WERDA that saved me a little bit of time. Uh, I'm going to talk about WERDA and other things. So let's get right into it. Um, Emily talked a little bit about appropriations. It's mostly good news right now. In the House, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service appropriations mimic what was in the FY20. Um, of $40 million uh, for aquatic invasive species. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, that's all good. You can see the CARP numbers are about the same. AAS plans, about the same. Um, Tahoe, Lamprey, everything is, this is all good in the house. Um, and remember, I can't see my right-hand side there, but FY 2019, you see that on the upper right, that was 20 million or something dollars. That's, so we went from 20, to 40 and we're still at 40. So um, we should continue to see uh, funds rolling forward th um, in uh, FY21, similar to FY20. On the uh, other side of the aisle in the appropriations process for FY2021, uh, aquatic use of species, there it is, $41 million. That's what we want to see. Uh, that's um, $70,000 above last year. Um, and I had bolded there that they provide, they're providing a $500,000 for muscle eradication as well as an additional, I can't see it, I think it was 200,000 for research on hydrilla eel, <laughs> I don't know what that is, and, and milfoil invasive uh, grasses, so I got to check that eel thing, I don't know what that is, uh, and then down at the bottom, um, Kind of interesting, the service shall submit a report describing its current effort to prevent the introduction of invasive species to uninvaded ecosystems. Um, that's report language that the the interesting part there is uninvaded ecosystems because that's, um, you know, the northwest third of the country that does not have, um, at least for us, for quagga mussels and there's other stuff, starry stonewort, et cetera. Okay, uh, WERDA, this is what we got this year. The FY20 budget, $15 million for watercraft inspection stations, $3 million for monitoring. And then under flowering rush, Kim, I heard you say that you have flowering rush. The flowering rush program is nationwide. And what they did this year or last, last fiscal year is they added in um, to control monitoring and surveys. Um, and the, that way, uh, Oregon now can participate. Oregon is, the, the senators from Oregon put this line item into the budget, but then they couldn't use it. It's a really long story. You don't want to hear it because my hair will fall out. What's left of it? Um, here's the House FY21 energy and uh, water appropriations. This has $15 million watercraft inspection stations, $3 million of monitoring, Flowering rush is mentioned. They added in hydrilla to flowering rush. So going forward, the flowering rush program may also include hydrilla. This is worth watching. Um, on the Senate side for appropriations on, on WERDA, they're at a lower amount, a million, or so there's the million for flowering rush, uh, six million for nationwide research on plants, aquatic plant management, and then $11 million, not 15 like the house, for watercraft, and then $2 million, not three like the house, for monitoring. 
Okay, so what are they going to do? They've got appropriations bills on each side. Um, Senate's probably about to pass. Um, let me back up. Um, on 2020 word of reauthorization, this is the bill. Um, there'll be um, each side is the House has passed its bill. The Senate um, is about to pass its bill. Then they need to go to conference committee to finalize, and then it needs to be signed by the president. And then they have a month or so to get this done. Usually they run up right before Christmas, then they'll end, end that Congress. Um, this we've seen, this we've seen. Okay. Um, so, wait, oh, my slides are out of order. You've seen, well, maybe not, I haven't seen all of this. Okay, so that last, this slide, that should have gone at the end of, this is what happens when I don't review stuff. So. Okay, let me go back up, hang on, hang on. Okay, so we're gonna talk about reauthorization again of WordA. As Clayton mentioned, they're gonna fix the Arizona and uh, an Arkansas issue, make that correct. Get rid of Arkansas, put in, uh, get rid of Arizona, put in Arkansas. Another basin is gonna be added if this language is adopted by, by both houses and finalized. And that's the Russian River in California. Um, on the Senate side of the reauthorization, and you'll see at the top of these slides, um, if you need more information on these bills, you can go to westernaas.org and then go to that issue and it will give you that 3591 American Water Infrastructure Language. So the Senate did a lot. There's a lot of language in here. One of the interesting parts is, authorizes the secretary to carry out a pilot program in collaboration with the states in the upper Missouri basin. Um, part of that's kind of going on right now, but it looks like they're going to add some additional language. And then also look above there, section 1604. This uh, authorizes $10 million to support watercraft inspection stations along the U.S. border with Canada. The way I read that, that goes from Alaska to Maine. So that's that could be a big deal as well. Um, Yukon River, for example, um, St. Lawrence Seaway, lots. There's information in S3590, there's text in 3591 on terrestrial noxious weeds, invasive species risk assessment, our Asian carp prevention, uh, down and down. And at the bottom there you see invasive species and alpine lakes pilot program. And that can be read, one of those Alpine lakes is like Tahoe. And um, they do, Tahoe has a great program, Dennis Abago running that, who's chair of the WRP. So interesting that's been mentioned there. So if all of the House and Senate language goes to conference and is adopted, and they usually do that in, um, in Florida, it's a bipartisan bill. Everybody's lovey-dovey. Um, we'll see the Russian River added. And you guys are looking at that map going, Russian River? Um, early on, when we started looking for, for funding for invasive species in the West, and we identified um, our friends at the Corps of Engineers and WERDA, um, Representative Mike Thompson out of California was of great help. And now you see Mike Thompson, it, the way I look at it, and I don't mean this as an insult, he's getting paid. So, and good for him. Um, Russian River has a lot of, uh, you know, vineyards and uh, there's the Eel River, uh, Potter Valley Project. Um, you know, it is a good place to do some match funding. So if that happens, I'm looking forward to seeing it. And it's also in one of our member states of California. Okay, quickly on other legislation that has been passed in the 106th Congress. 
106 Congress is about to end. Um, the, the Dingle Act was passed, and this, you probably, see, some of you have seen uh, emails over the last several months from Hillary Smith and Scott Cameron on Invasive Species Strategic Plan. The comments were due on that 10920. That came out of the Dingle Act. Uh, a Nutria bill was passed, and it revises the grant program. It adds money to it. I think now the Nutria grant program, I believe now it's nationwide. And I'm thinking it's a $10 million authorization. That doesn't mean it's appropriated and that money is gonna come flooding through to kill the giant rats. Um, but really good, this got passed. Um, America's Conservation Act, known as ACE. Uh, this had a broad, this was a broad, all-inclusive, bipartisan bill to capture uh, National Fish and Wildlife Partnership Program, North American Wetlands. I think there's some Teddy Roosevelt stuff in there as well. Um, but they did have a section on invasive species under the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act. They are authorizing 2.5 for, uh, for the core and 2.5 million for interior. Um, so that's another potential pot of funding for the states. Good news. Uh, this is what has not passed so far. Stop the spread of aquatic invasive species. I think that's at the end. Um, SIMS, this was introduced. We worked this one for years uh, with uh, Elizabeth Brown was key in this. Uh, and uh, during our NISA events, um, 2975 was, it's still a possibility it might happen. I don't think so. Um, this would add Bureau of Reclamation basically to the 50-50 share program that's uh, the Corps is doing right now. It would, exp it would expand it out to add BOR. I don't think this is going to pass this time. Uh, the other one, the biggie is uh, RAWA. This is not passed. If it does pass, uh, it's $1.3 billion. And part of that money could be used for invasives. We will see this again next year. Um, and eventually this thing is going to pass. So the good news is, is there's some uh, nuisance species, invasive nuisance species language in there. What did not pass, um, we may see this one again. This is um, the Conservation Corps Act. It does talk about controlling invasive species. It's got a big price tag. You go, oh my God, why 55 billion? During all the COVID relief uh, talks, people are rolling out these big bills, hoping that they'll get um, sucked into the to the trillion dollar packages. So I, that's why I mentioned it. But in, again, invasive species uh, is in there. If um, you're ever interested in looking on what type of legislation is ongoing, you can go to westernas.org, regulations, scroll down, and Robin Drawheim has a table there for 115th and 116th Congress. Um, some other things. Um, we're going to put out an AIS news this afternoon, and we'll have some updated appropriations language that you can read. Um, I have seen two stories in the last six hours on whether the government will shut down. And a lot of times, uh, newspapers will just run the stories for, um, you know, for clickbait. But the Hill says. Um, the publication of the Hill says, should we worry about a shutdown? Um, Roll Call said something you know, just a little while ago that uh, Trump is buying off on the FY21 budget, um, the omnibus budget. That's good news because if that omnibus budget passes, all of the FY21 stuff that I showed you earlier, I know, I'm sorry, it's a little confusing. I didn't have my slides in order. Um, that stuff will get passed, which means we'll get the $41 million in the Fish and Wildlife Service. Hopefully, they'll agree, um, you know, on, on $15 million for uh, watercraft inspections and $3 million. Um, so I think we're in real good shape, but what we'll be looking for is to get this uh, FY21 budget done and get the WERDA done, F the 2020 WERDA, adjourn the Congress and then start with a new slate next year. And we'll be in really good shape and be able to show that off to the new administration and look for new partners. Thank you.
Thanks, Stephen. Okay, we definitely slid into home base. That was perfect. Uh, <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions for Stephen or Clayton, legislative, WERDA related? I have a question for Stephen. Okay, go ahead. Can you tell us your, that, yeah. is that Clayton again speaking? Yeah, Jason Geckler. Jason oh, Jason. Sorry. Hey, hey, Stephen, do you have a whiteboard in the background where you plot these things out like Final Four, uh, NCAA? I was just kind of curious how you track all that. Um, yeah, based on my my current football betting, uh, no, I don't have a giant whiteboard. Um, yeah, no, we've just got, I mean, really, Jason, what it comes down to is um, following the word of thing is gotten us to the point where, um, you know, we've been watching. I'm just glad that, you know, like that Rawa and some of these others haven't, aren't active right now. Because for those of us junkies for DC and politics and Capitol Hill, it's, it's showtime right now. It's the golden hour. There is so much stuff going on. Um, and, you know, and Jason, I have to go back and thank you for the work you did you know, you've done with MICRA and the Mississippi panel back in your state days, because we're starting to see after many years of frustration and sitting at the bar and crying in our beer, um, we're starting to see successes. And, you know, the Missouri Basin states were a part of that. So that's great. I just enjoyed the beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? on topic for the last speakers here. Oh, one more thing. Yeah. The 100th Meridian website. Um, 100th Meridian.org was, um, it wasn't renewed by the owners, Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, so it lapsed and now it's owned, I think by a, a Polish gambling syndicate. Um, the, I'm not making this up. The website is still there, and I still get requests for don't move a muscle videos about once a week. But if you look at the site, what you'll see is that there's some odd language and links in there. I don't think it's um, malicious, but we don't. We tried. We tried bidding on getting the site back. All of the old um, 100th Meridian content is on Western. Um, westernais.org um, under coordination. You can find it. Um, I wish we could get that site back, but it's beyond our control. Thank you. Right, like it's still out there. Like you can type in 100thmeridian.org, but yeah, it's it's been overtaken. So, um, Okay, so with the remaining time on here, um, I have the agenda up and um, I think the idea was just to do a little bit of sharing, and I know it's a little bit clunky here with the the tech version of what we're doing. Um, but just you know, are there you know things that people want to bring to light um, in terms of you know next steps for moving forward, things you guys want to work on, um, that that type of nature of activities. Um, I know you guys normally would meet in this kind of more in the summer. I think, and here we are in November. So, um, so yeah, I guess to open the floor, does anybody, are there any specific things that um, from that base? Say that like, how should we move forward? Like in this era of COVID, trying to do a, a, another webinar, you know, tentatively in a year or, um, communicate in different ways just to stay connected so i think any and all um, comments would be welcome or stay as you guys have been doing yes so any comments from anybody you should be able to um actually here's maybe that what i'll do is do an unmute all again and then you guys can self mute so um i'll, un I'll unmute everybody So if you have a comment, feel free to lob it out there.
No comment. Okay, well that's easy. Oh, Kim, you're unmuted. Do you have something to say? <laughs> no, um, no, I was just gonna say, I mean, I really appreciated us getting together again in this virtual um, venue because there are so many new coordinators and, um, you know, just getting to, to hear from you and, um, you know, just know that, you know, those of us who have been around for a while are, are, are here to help too. And, you know, hopefully everybody found this beneficial. Um, I know we had a little small group that talked about, should we do this? And I'm really glad that that we did. And I think everyone um, is. So, you know, we used to do cooperative, you know, big projects like order educational stuff, or we fund Montana Lab. And, you know, a lot of that was with, with money, money from, um, you know, that the 100th Meridian got. And it seems like all that money is is spoken for. So, th so that's fine. Um, so I don't don't really know about project wise or anything like that moving forward, but I think just getting together to talk is is hugely important. So this is a first star with Nebraska. I just have a couple a couple points on what we talked about. Um, in in relation to the Montana Belge Lab and prioritizing water bodies. You know, at least in our agency, that's something I'm gonna have to talk with my my chief about because we, you know, we have shifting landscapes on what water bodies. You know, right now Nebraska does not have any lakes interior besides an Air Force Base lake, positive for Belger, uh, positive for zebra mussels. So really, it's the middle of the Missouri River proper that um, is is what we're worried about as, as far as a vector. So, and we know that's that's obviously already positive. So, um, so that's just the first thing is, you know, I, you know, I understand totally the um, the Montana folks uh, and they do a great help. And, uh, you know, that's part of the reason I, you know, we are trying in Nebraska to get our own in-house lab to maybe run our own samples like that. So, absolutely. Um, I'm excited about WERDA where, you know, like I said, part of the reason that I think all of us without a lot of funding, you know, we we want to have more inspectors and stations, but the money's just not there. So I'm hoping that this WERDA um, realization can give us some money too. So, and then also, I guess the last point I wanted to talk about is, you know, it, it may be nice to have sort of a basin wide um, outreach template I think that would be very helpful for when we put out stuff on social media and billboards and stuff, just so um, you know we don't have to do something that somebody has already done. But I guess if that makes sense. So those are just a few points I just wanted to chime in on. So thanks, Chris. Um, I guess to retouch on your comments there. So Stacy, do you feel like you're gonna, you know, maybe send a group email with your suggested prioritization levels or how does, is there gonna be sort of more of a deliberate way of going about, um, you know, addressing that in the future? Stacy, are you there still? I see you unmuted. Huh. Leah, people still have to click the unmute button to talk on their own computers. Right. Stacy, but I can't hear you. <laughs> She's gonna do smoke signals for us. You could always put it into the questions there. Yeah, I know. I don't know why we're having so many weird technical glitches. Stacy, do you want to put an answer into the, the question area and then, okay, 
Um, and then I, I wasn't sure if on your, uh, Chris, your comment on some, a basin wide outreach template. I don't know if um, Allison, you had any comments about some of that. I know, you know, the Western states collectively have um, gathered a lot of information to that end. And I don't know if there's any feedback you wanted to share there or not. Yeah. Um, so I've served on the, the Mississippi River Basin panel and then also the Western Regional panel. And we have put together lots of templates for billboards, for signage, for digital media. And we're even doing that right now in a comprehensive survey so that we have um, all those at, at a database level. So all of those templates are in place and happy to share them with everybody. Great, Allison, that sounds very helpful. Yeah, this was Chris again. I, I guess I was more thinking on state agency level when, you know, we're talking about what folks put out on, you know, messaging and stuff like that. Not, I mean, I mean, I understand that there's templates for billboards and stuff like that, but more like what Iowa DNR does in their guide and on AIS and things like that, just some of the wording and everything. So I mean, maybe that's just more of a discussion with the other AIS coordinators than 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 with everybody. So, but thank you. Okay, fair enough. I know I appreciated Kim's comment about the. I'm not sure if it's a self-made acronym that you did with the OTTs, the over-the-top commercials, but sort of that, that some of those approaches are pretty pretty innovative and fun. That's good. Um, okay, so Stacy said that. Um, yeah, she she can plan on doing what I had mentioned of maybe doing sort of more of a direct email query on some of those uh, water body or uh, location prioritizations for the sample processing. Um, does anybody else have any comments they want to make? Yeah, Leah, this is Josh out of Wyoming. Um, on the same topic of the um, Montana lab and prioritization, I like I like the idea, and I, I thank Montana for all the work they do on running those samples. But something I was kind of just doing over after she brought that up was um, if they have a certain allocation for each state, I think I remember correctly, 300 for Wyoming. I don't know if we could just um, come up with a percentage of those samples that we could have dedicated towards a higher prioritization. So. Um, some are like 10%, so we decide that 30 of our 300 can be um, prioritized at a higher turnover rate um, and let the, let the states decide which those waters are that get sent in. Um, I don't know if that would be an option, but something that I was, and 10% can be, that's just a number I threw and stuck at the wall, so that's something we can discuss, but um, there's something I was thinking about. Thanks, Josh. I I almost feel like Stacy had kind of alluded to that as well as sometimes depending on how the samples come to them. Um, but that seems seems like a wise thing. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other general comments or questions for needs to share? This is Kim again. Um, I want to echo what Jason said to to Stephen. Like, thank you for keeping track of all of that legislation because that's that's crazy. Um, but it really impacts a lot of what we do. And it, you know, for me personally, I'm really familiar with what's going on in Werda and the Asian carp world for the for the Upper Mississippi River. But because you know we're not included in the the watercraft inspection stuff for the Upper Mitt, Upper Missouri. I, haven't been keeping track of that. So that was all, and like I didn't know about the flowering rush stuff. And so that was really good information. And I, get, I think that also is just something that is really helpful when we get together to just share it. Cause you can read stuff, but when you actually say it, it's so much easier to understand. So that's another really huge thing that um, I took away from today and, and our meeting. So thank you. Great. All right, I'm just checking here. Let's see if I have a question. So Stacy also Tom, said, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead, Tom. No, go ahead, close the loop on that. 
Yeah, Stacy says that if any states have updated priority lists, please send them to her. Thank you. Go ahead, Tom. Great, thank you. Uh, and just to follow up with Kim, um, the Don't Let It Loose campaign, uh, we run that in Montana, Invasive Species Action Network through LEA uh, kind of leads the charge on a lot of that work. And we're looking to try to expand that next year uh, in Montana. So uh, Kim, if you have ideas or, or other states um, would like to coordinate on that, that's, that's a pathway that I think needs more attention and collectively, we've got a good message. There's a good campaign out there. I think it, uh, getting our heads together and thinking about next steps on, on how to roll that out um, more broadly. Um, working with Leah, I, I think, is a great idea. Yeah, I'd love to see Don't Let It Loose everywhere. Yes, <laughs> I think that'd be great. Yeah, I think, you know, so some of the Sea Grant states, um, Minnesota and Wisconsin, Michigan, Michigan has a new program called Ripple. Like, don't remember yeah. what that stands for. So they've been doing some of that. So yeah, I think um, some coordination going forward with that. So like, yeah, we don't all have to reinvent the wheel, but it's, it's you know, and we have goldfish everywhere in our urban ponds. We're really ramping up our urban pond fishing program in Iowa. And, you know, many of them are overrun with giant goldfish. So um, yeah, that's a good point, Tom, that we should um, talk about that some more or coordinate. Hey, one thing just to piggyback on that is that in Canada, they have two really successful don't let it loose uh, campaigns that I just learned about on Naisma. So um, really exciting the amount of money that they're putting into outreach in Canada as well. And so I've been kind of tapping in with them on outreach materials too. So if you're interested in learning more about that, let me know. Maybe a future discussion or an, on a future meeting have a more discussion on this might be good. Um, so uh, not to just keep us on the phone if we don't have stuff to talk or on the webinar, but some of the pieces, I guess, just to close the loop on too, um, just to make sure in the current distribution list that I have been emailing everyone with, you know, if there's other people that should be included in that, you know, email group um, or to be invited to this meeting, you know, just, just let me know, flag it, and then we can make sure the right people are getting getting invited to, you know, have conversations and join in. Um, and then I guess for a future meeting, um, I don't know about anybody getting together, going anywhere anytime soon. Do you guys want to try to um, just hold a call in the springtime or just plan to talk, um, I guess, you know, we could have a call in the springtime, and then if there's a possibility of gathering face to face, that could be determined maybe at that time. What do you guys think about either a next meeting or a next call? Any feedback there? Yeah, we could do like May, and then, but we gotta go bowling. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and maybe shoot for something in the summer. But I, I'd say we maybe like in February or something, or late January take the temperature of the room and see where we are. I think that's a good idea, um, especially since maybe, you know, we should have a federal budget by then. Gosh, I hope so. Um, so we would know a little bit more about the money, uh, like a check-in, you know, a couple hours or something like that. But, but yeah, hopefully, I mean, I don't know if we can get together next summer or not, but yes, that was traditionally our, our time frame was, was in the summer. Um, sometime because then we could um do a field trip as well so um i like steven's proposal so kim just on the the summer meeting was there sort of a um i don't know rhyme or reason to where you guys went or was it just sort of someone said hey i want to host everybody and you'd go there what was the the, the scheme there that was pretty much it or else it was you were shamed into doing it because you hadn't you know hosted before or for a long time but we always <laughs> wanted someone to volunteer first and then if not or in the case of Stephen, he'd never been to North Dakota wasn't that the point so, so we had to have a meeting in, in North Dakota um so yeah it was okay. it was truly someone and it, it really isn't that difficult to coordinate because it's 
not that many people. So it's basically yeah. just finding a place to, to host. We had talked about in the past and if folks were interested in doing some of the organization work where we could uh, just provide potentially some meeting space, that is something that is still an option in the future once we get past all of the pandemic. And this, this is Kara with MDC. Um, yeah, hopefully by summer we'll have a new invasive species coordinator, so that may be good timing to get them involved. If there's a meeting here in Missouri, to get them involved and caught up to speed on the aquatic side. Exactly. That was something that was brought up, Kara, when we talked about it in the future, that that might have been a good time to meet them, introduce them to the group. Emily, I know, um, you know, like, and Jessica wanted to like get people out to see the electrified dozer or something. So that'd be really cool if we could yeah. somehow coordinate yeah. all of that. Yep, exactly. But again, I, we really cannot move forward with any plans until we are past, at least for from Fish and Wildlife Service perspective. Um, but we can't move forward with hosting meetings until we have clearance. Obviously. Right. Well, right. And I think people may be under travel restrictions too. So we can cross our fingers and keep in touch, I guess, right? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. One of these days it'll happen. Yeah.